Chapter 34 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 The Colosseum. France had so managed his route that during the ride to the Colosseum they passed not a single ancient ruin, so that no preliminary impression interfered to mitigate the colossal proportions of the gigantic building they came to admire. The road selected was a continuation of the Via Sistina. Then, by cutting off the right angle of the street, in which stands Santa Maria Maggiore, and proceeding by the Via Urbana and San Pietro in Vincoli, the travellers would find themselves directly opposite the Colosseum. This itinerary possessed another great advantage, that of leaving France at full liberty to indulge his deep reverie upon the subject of Signor Pastrini's story in which his mysterious host of Monte Cristo was so strangely mixed up. Seated with folded arms in a corner of the carriage, he continued to ponder over the singular history he had so lately listened to, and to ask himself an interminable number of questions, touching its various circumstances, without, however, arriving at a satisfactory reply to any of them. One fact more than the rest brought his friend... Sinbad the sailor back to his recollection, and that was the mysterious sort of intimacy that seemed to exist between the brigands and the sailors, and Pastrini's account of Vampa's having found refuge on board the vessels of smugglers and fishermen reminded Franz of the two Corsican bandits he had found supping so amicably with the crew of the little yacht, which had even deviated from its course and touched at Porto Vecchio for the sole purpose of landing them. The very name assumed by his host of Monte Cristo, and again repeated by the landlord of the Hôtel de Londres, abundantly proved to him that his island friend was playing his philanthropic part on the shores of Piombino, Civita Vecchio, Ostia, and Gaeta, as on those of Corsica, Tuscany, and Spain. And further, France besought him of having heard his singular entertainer speak both of Tunis and Palermo, proving thereby how largely his circle of acquaintances extended. But however the mind of the young man might be absorbed in these reflections, they were at once dispersed at the sight of the dark, frowning ruins of the stupendous Colosseum, through the various openings of which the pale moonlight played and flickered like the unearthly gleam from the eyes of the wandering dead. The carriage stopped near the Meta Sudans, the door was opened, and the young men, eagerly alighting, found themselves opposite a cicerone, who appeared to have sprung up from the ground. So unexpected was his appearance. The usual guide from the hotel having followed them, they had paid two conductors. Uh, nor is it possible at Rome to avoid this abundant supply of guides, besides the ordinary cicerone who seizes upon you directly you set foot in your hotel, and never quits you while you remain in the city. There's also a special cicerone belonging to each monument, nay, almost to each part of a monument. It may therefore be easily imagined there is no scarcity of guides at the Colosseum, that wonder of all ages, which Marshall thus eulogizes. Let Memphis cease to boast the barbarous miracles of her pyramids, and the wonders of Babylon be talked of no more among us. All must bow to the superiority of the gigantic labour of the Caesars, and the many voices of fame spread far and wide the surpassing merits of this incomparable monument. As for Albert and France, they essayed not to escape from their Ciceronian tyrants, and indeed it would have been so much the more difficult to break their bondage, as the guides alone are permitted to visit these monuments with torches in their hands. Thus then the young men made no attempt at resistance, but blindly and confidently surrendered themselves into the care and custody of their conductors. Albert had already made seven or eight similar excursions to the Colosseum, while his less favoured companion trod for the first time in his life the classic ground forming the monument of Flavius Vespasian, and to his credit, be it spoken, his mind even amid the glib loquacity of the guides was duly and deeply touched with awe and enthusiastic admiration of all he saw, and certainly no adequate notion of these stupendous ruins 
can be formed save by such as have visited them, and more especially by moonlight, at which time the vast proportions of the building appear twice as large when viewed by the mysterious beams of a southern moonlit sky, whose rays are sufficiently clear and vivid to light the horizon with a glow equal to the soft twilight of an eastern clime. Scarcely, therefore, had the reflective France walked a hundred steps beneath the interior porticoes of the ruin, than, abandoning Albert to the guides, who would by no means yield their prescriptive right of carrying their victims through the routine regularly laid down, and as regularly followed by them, but dragged the unconscious visitor to the various objects with a pertinacity that admitted of no appeal, beginning as a matter of course with the lion's den and finishing with Caesar's podium. To escape a jargon and mechanical survey of the wonders by which he was surrounded, Franz ascended a half-dilapidated staircase, and leaving them to follow their monotonous round, seated himself at the foot of a column, and immediately opposite a large aperture, which permitted him to enjoy a full and undisturbed view of the gigantic dimensions of the majestic ruin. France had remained for nearly a quarter of an hour perfectly hidden by the shadow of the vast column at whose base he had found a resting place, and from whence his eyes followed the motions of Albert and his guides, who, holding torches in their hands, had emerged from a vomitarium at the opposite extremity of the Colosseum, and then again disappeared down the steps, conducting to the seats reserved for the Vestal Virgins, resembling as they glided along some restless shades following the flickering glare of so many ignes fatuis. All at once his ear caught a sound resembling that of a stone rolling down the staircase opposite the one by which he had himself ascended. There was nothing remarkable in the circumstance of a fragment of granite giving way and falling heavily below, but it seemed to him that the substance that fell gave way beneath the pressure of a foot and also that someone who endeavoured as much as possible to prevent his footsteps from being heard was approaching the spot where he sat. Conjecture soon became certainty, for the figure of a man was distinctly visible to France, gradually emerging from the staircase opposite, upon which the moon was at that moment pouring a full tide of silvery brightness. The stranger, thus presenting himself, was probably a person who, like France, preferred the enjoyment of solitude and his own thoughts to the frivolous gabble of the guides, and his appearance had nothing extraordinary in it, but the hesitation with which he proceeded, stopping and listening with anxious attention at every step he took, convinced France that he expected the arrival of some person. By a sort of instinctive impulse, France withdrew as much as possible behind his pillar, about ten feet from the spot where he and the stranger were, the roof had given way, leaving a large round opening, through which might be seen the blue vault of heaven, thickly studded with stars. Around this opening, which had possibly for ages permitted a free entrance to the brilliant moonbeams that now illumined the vast pile, grew a quantity of creeping plants, whose delicate green branches stood out in bold relief against the clear azure of the firmament while large masses of thick, strong, fibrous shoots forced their way through the chasm and hung floating to and fro like so many waving strings. The person whose mysterious arrival had attracted the attention of France stood in a kind of half-light that rendered it impossible to distinguish his features, although his dress was easily made out. He wore a large brown mantle, one fold of which, thrown over his left shoulder, served likewise to mask the lower part of his countenance, while the upper part was completely hidden by his broad-brimmed hat. The lower part of his dress was more distinctly visible by the bright rays of the moon, which, entering through the broken ceiling, shed their refulgent beams on feet cased in elegantly made boots of polished leather, over which descended fashionably cut trousers of black cloth. From the imperfect means... France had of judging, he could only come to one conclusion, that the person whom he was thus watching certainly belonged to no inferior station of life. Some few minutes had elapsed, and the stranger began to show manifest signs of impatience. 
when a slight noise was heard outside the aperture in the roof, and almost immediately a dark shadow seemed to obstruct the flood of light that had entered it, and the figure of a man was clearly seen gazing with eager scrutiny on the immense space beneath him. Then as his eye caught sight of him in the mantle, he grasped a floating mass of thickly matted boughs and glided down by their help to within three or four feet of the ground, and then leapt lightly on his feet. The man who had performed this daring act with so much indifference wore the Transtevere costume. "'I beg your excellency's pardon for keeping you waiting,' said the man in the Roman dialect. Uh, "'But I don't think I'm many minutes after my time. A ten o'clock has just struck on the Lateran.' "'Say not a word about being late,' replied the stranger in purest Tuscan. "'Tis I who am too soon. But even if you had caused me to wait a little while, I should have felt quite sure that the delay was not occasioned by any fault of yours. "'Your Excellency is perfectly right in so thinking,' said the man. "'I came here direct from the castle of Sant'Angelo, and I had an immense deal of trouble before I could get a chance to speak to Beppo.' "'And uh, who is Beppo?' "'Oh, Beppo is employed in the prison, and I give him so much a year to let me know what is going on with his holiness's castle. Indeed, you are a provident person, I see. Why, you see, no one knows what may happen. Perhaps some of these days I may be entrapped like poor Peppino, and may be very glad to have some little nibbling mouse to gnaw the meshes of my net, and so help me out of prison. Briefly, what did you glean? that two executions of considerable interest will take place the day after tomorrow, at two o'clock as is customary at Rome at the commencement of all great festivals. One of the culprits will be Mazzolato. He is an atrocious villain who murdered the priest who brought him up and deserves not the smallest pity. The other sufferer is sentenced to be decapitato, and he, your excellency, is poor Peppino. The fact is that you have inspired not only the pontifical government, but also the neighbouring states with such extreme a fear that they are glad of all opportunity of making an example. But Peppino did not even belong to my band. He was merely a poor shepherd whose only crime consisted in furnishing us with provisions which makes him your accomplice to all intents and purposes, but mark the distinction with which he is treated. Instead of being knocked on the head as you would be if once they caught hold of you, he is simply sentenced to be guillotined, by which means, too, the amusements of the day are diversified, and there is a spectacle to please every spectator. Without reckoning, the wholly unexpected one I am preparing to surprise them with. My good friend, said the man in the cloak, excuse me for saying that you seem to me precisely in the mood to commit some wild or extravagant act. Perhaps I am, but the one thing I have resolved on, and that is to stop at nothing to restore a poor devil to liberty, who has got into this scrape solely from having saved me. I should hate and despise myself as a coward did I desert the brave fellow in his present extremity. And what do you mean to do? To surround the scaffold with twenty of my best men, who at a signal from me will rush forward directly Peppino is brought for execution, and by the assistance of their stilettos drive back the guard and carry off the prisoner. That seems to me as hazardous as uncertain, and convinces me that my scheme is far better than yours. And what is your Excellency's project? Just this. I will so advantageously bestow two thousand piastres, that the person receiving them shall obtain a respite till next year for Peppino. And during that year, another skilfully placed one thousand piastres will afford him the means of escaping from his prison. 
and do you feel sure of succeeding? Pardieu, exclaimed the man in the cloak, suddenly expressing himself in French. What did your excellency say? inquired the other. I said, my good fellow, that I would do more single-handedly by the means of gold than you and all your troop could effect with stilettos, pistols, carbines, and blunderbusses included. Leave me, then, to act, and have no fears for the result. At least there can be no harm in myself and party being in readiness in case your excellency should fail. None whatever. Take what precautions you please, if it is any satisfaction to you to do so but rely upon my obtaining the reprieve I seek. Remember, the execution is fixed for the day after tomorrow, and that you have but one day to work in. And what of that? Is not a day divided into twenty-four hours, each hour into sixty minutes, and every minute subdivided into sixty seconds? Now in 86,400 seconds very many things can be done. And how shall I know whether your excellency has succeeded or not? Oh, that is very easily arranged. I have engaged the three lower windows at the Café Rospoli. Should I have obtained the requisite pardon for Peppino, the two outside windows will be hung with yellow damasks, and the centre with white, having a large cross in red marked on it. And whom will you employ to carry the reprieve to the officer directing the execution? Send one of your men, disguised as a penitent friar, and I will give it to him. His dress will procure him the means of approaching the scaffold itself, and he will deliver the official order to the officer who in his turn will hand it to the executioner. In the meantime, it will be as well to acquaint Pipino with what we have determined on, if it be only to prevent his dying of fear, or losing his senses, because in either case a very useless expense will have been incurred. Your Excellency, said the man, you are fully persuaded of my entire devotion to you, are you not? Nay, I flatter myself that there can be no doubt of it replied the cavalier in the cloak. Well, then, only fulfil your promise of rescuing Peppino, and henceforward you shall receive not only devotion, but the most absolute obedience from myself and those under me that one human being can render to another. Have a care how far you pledge yourself, my good friend, for I may remind you of your promise at some perhaps not very distant period, when I, in my turn, may require your aid and influence. Let that day come sooner or later, Your Excellency will find me what I have found you in this my heavy trouble, and if from the other end of the world you but write me word to do such or such a thing, you may regard it as done, for done it shall be, on the word and faith of sh interrupted the stranger. I hear a noise. Tis some travellers who are visiting the Colosseum by torchlight. Twere better we should not be seen together. Those guides are nothing but spies, and might possibly recognise you. And however I may be honoured by your friendship, my worthy friend, if once the extent of our intimacy were known, I am sadly afraid both my reputation and credit would suffer thereby. Well, then, if you obtain the reprieve, the middle window at the Café Rospoli will be hung with white damask bearing a red cross. And if you fail? Then all three windows will have yellow draperies. And then? And then, my good fellow, use your daggers in any way you please, and I further promise you to be there as a spectator of your prowess. We understand each other perfectly, then. Adieu, Your Excellency. Depend upon me, as firmly as I do upon you. Saying these words, the Transteverin disappeared down the staircase, while his companion, muffling his features more closely than before in the folds of his mantle, 
passed almost close to France, and descended to the arena by an outward flight of steps. The next minute Franz heard himself called by Albert, who made the lofty building re-echo with the sound of his friend's name. Franz, however, did not obey the summons till he had satisfied himself that the two men, whose conversation he had overheard, were at a sufficient distance to prevent his encountering them in his descent. In ten minutes after the strangers had departed, Franz was on the road to the Piazza di Spagni listening with studied indifference to the learned dissertation delivered by Albert after the manner of Pliny and Calpurnius, touching the iron-pointed nets used to prevent the ferocious beasts from springing on the spectators. France let him proceed without interruption, and, in fact, did not hear what was said. He longed to be alone and free to ponder over all that had occurred. One of the two men whose mysterious meeting in the Colosseum he had so unintentionally witnessed, was an entire stranger to him. But not so the other, and though Franz had been unable to distinguish his features from his being either wrapped in his mantle or obscured by the shadow, the tones of his voice had made too powerful an impression on him the first time he had heard them, for him ever again to forget them, hear them when or where he might. It was more especially when this man was speaking in a manner half jesting, half bitter, that Franz's ear recalled most vividly the deep, sonorous yet well-pitched voice that had addressed him in the Grotto of Monte Cristo, and which he heard for the second time amid the darkness and ruined grandeur of the Colosseum. And the more he thought, the more entire was his conviction that the person who wore the mantle was no other than his former host and entertainer, Sinbad the Sailor. Under any other circumstances, France would have found it impossible to resist his extreme curiosity to know more of so singular a personage, and with that intent have sought to renew their short acquaintance. But in the present instance, the confidential nature of the conversation he had overheard made him with propriety judge that his appearance at such time would be anything but agreeable. As we have seen, therefore, he permitted his former host to retire without attempting a recognition, but fully promising himself a rich indemnity for his present forbearance, should chance afford him another opportunity. In vain did France endeavour to forget the many perplexing thoughts which assailed him. In vain did he court the refreshment of sleep. Slumber refused to visit his eyelids, and the night was passed in feverish contemplation of the chain of circumstances tending to prove the identity of the mysterious visitant to the Colosseum with the inhabitant of the Grotto of Monte Cristo. And the more he thought, the firmer grew his opinion on the subject. Worn out at length, he fell asleep at daybreak and did not awake till late. Like a genuine Frenchman, Albert had employed his time in arranging for the evening's diversion. He had sent to engage a box at the Teatro Argentino, and Franz, having a number of letters to write, relinquished the carriage to Albert for the whole of the day. At five o'clock, Albert returned, delighted with his day's work. He had been occupied in leaving his letters of introduction, and had received in return more invitations to balls and routs than it would be possible for him to accept. Besides this, he had seen, as he called it, all the remarkable sights at Rome. Yes, in a single day, he had accomplished what his more serious-minded companion would have taken weeks to effect. Neither had he neglected to ascertain the name of the piece to be played that night at the Teatro Argentino, and also what performers appeared in it. The opera of Parisina was announced for representation, and the principal actors were Coselli, Moriani and La Specia. The young man, therefore, had reason to consider themselves fortunate in having the opportunity of hearing one of the best works by the composer of Lucia di Lammermoor, supported by three of the most renowned vocalists of Italy. Albert had never been able to endure the Italian theatres, with their orchestras from which it is impossible to see, and the absence of balconies or open boxes. All these defects pressed hard on a man who had had his stall at the bouffe, and had shared a lower box at the opera. Still, in spite of this, 
Albert displayed his most dazzling and effective costumes each time he visited the theatres. But alas, his elegant toilet was wholly thrown away, and one of the most worthy representatives of Parisian fashion had to carry with him the mortifying reflection that he had nearly overrun Italy without meeting with a single adventure. Sometimes Albert would affect to make a joke of his want of success, but internally he was deeply wounded, and his self-love immensely piqued to think that Albert de Morcerf, the most admired and most sought-after of any young person of his day, should thus be passed over, and merely have his labour for his pains. And the thing was so much the more annoying, as according to the characteristic modesty of a Frenchman, Albert had quitted Paris with the full conviction that he had only to show himself in Italy to carry all before him, and that upon his return he should astonish the Parisian world with the recital of his numerous love affairs. Alas, poor Albert! None of these interesting adventures fell in his way. The lovely Genoese, Florentine, and Neapolitans were all faithful, if not to their husbands, at least to their lovers, and thought not of changing even for the splendid appearance of Albert de Morcerf. And all he gained was the painful conviction that the ladies of Italy have this advantage over those of France, that they are faithful even in their infidelity. Yet he could not restrain a hope that in Italy, as elsewhere, there might be an exception to the general rule. Albert, besides being an elegant, well-looking young man, was also possessed of considerable talent and ability. Moreover, he was a viscount, a recently created one, certainly, but in the present day it is not necessary to go as far back as Noah in tracing a descent, and a genealogical tree is equally estimated, whether dated from 1399 or merely 1815. But to crown all these advantages, Albert de Morcerf commanded an income of 50,000 livres, a more than sufficient sum to render him a personage of considerable importance in Paris. It was therefore no small mortification to him to have visited most of the principal cities in Italy without having excited the most trifling observation. Albert, however, hoped to indemnify himself for all these slights and indifferences during the Carnival, knowing full well that among the different states and kingdoms in which this festivity is celebrated, Rome is the spot where even the wisest and gravest throw off the usual rigidity of their lives and deign to mingle in the follies of this time of liberty and relaxation. The carnival was to commence on the morrow. Therefore Albert had not an instant to lose in setting forth the programme of his hopes, expectations, and claims to notice. With this design he had engaged a box in the most conspicuous part of the theatre, and exerted himself to set off his personal attractions by the aid of the most rich and elaborate toilet. The box taken by Albert was in the first circle, although each of the three tiers of boxes is deemed equally aristocratic, and is for this reason generally styled the nobility's boxes. And although the box engaged for the two friends was sufficiently capacious to contain at least a dozen persons, it had cost less than would be paid at some of the French theatres for one admitting merely four occupants. Another motive had influenced Albert's selection of his seat. Who knew but that, thus advantageously placed, he might not in truth attract the notice of some fair Roman, and an introduction might ensue that would procure him the offer of a seat in a carriage, or a place in a princely balcony from which he might behold the gaieties of the Carnival. These united considerations made Albert more lively and anxious to please than he had hitherto been. Totally disregarding the business of the stage, he leaned from his box and began attentively scrutinizing the beauty of each pretty woman, aided by a powerful opera glass. But alas, this attempt to attract notice wholly failed. Not even curiosity had been excited, and it was but too apparent that the lovely creatures into whose good graces he was desirous of stealing were all so much engrossed with themselves, their lovers, or their own thoughts, that they had not so much as noticed him 
or the manipulation of his glass. The truth was that the anticipated pleasures of the carnival with the Holy Week that was to succeed it so filled every fair breast as to prevent the least attention being bestowed even on the business of the stage. The actors made their entries and exits unobserved or unthought of. At certain conventional moments, the spectators would suddenly cease their conversation or rouse themselves from their musings to listen to some brilliant effort of Moriani's, a well-executed recitative by Coselli, or to join in loud applause at the wonderful powers of La Specia. But that momentary excitement over, they quickly relapsed into their former state of preoccupation or interesting conversation. Towards the close of the first act, the door of a box which had been hitherto vacant was opened. A lady entered to whom France had been introduced in Paris, where indeed he had imagined she still was. The quick eye of Albert caught the involuntary start with which his friend beheld the new arrival, and turning to him he said hastily, "'Do you know the woman who has just entered that box?' "'Yes. What did you think of her?' "'Oh, she is perfectly lovely. What a complexion! And such magnificent hair! Is she French?' "'No, a Venetian.' "'And her name is?' "'Countess... Uh... Ah, I know her by name,' exclaimed Albert. "'She is said to possess as much wit and cleverness as beauty. "'I was to have been presented to her when I met her at Madame Villefort's ball.' "'Shall I assist you in repairing your negligence?' asked Franz. "'My dear fellow, are you really on such good terms with her as to venture to take me to her box?' "'Why, I have only had the honour of being in her society, and conversing with her three or four times in my life. But you know that even such an acquaintance as that might warrant my doing what you ask.' At that instant, the Countess perceived Franz and graciously waved her hand to him, to which he replied by a respectful inclination of the head. "'Upon my word,' said Albert, "'you seem to be on excellent terms with the beautiful Countess.' "'You are mistaken in thinking so,' returned Franz calmly. "'But you merely fall into the same error which leads so many of our countrymen to commit the most egregious blunders.' I mean that of judging the habits and customs of Italy and Spain by our Parisian notions. Believe me, nothing is more fallacious than to form any estimate of the degree of intimacy you may suppose existing among persons by the familiar terms they seem upon. There is a similarity of feeling at this instant between ourselves and the Countess. Nothing more. Is there, indeed, my good fellow, Pray tell me, is it sympathy of heart? No, of taste, continued Franz gravely. And in what manner has this congeniality of mind been evinced? By the Countess's visiting the Colosseum, as we did last night, by moonlight and nearly alone. You were with her, then? I was. And what did you say to her? Oh, we talked of the illustrious dead of whom that magnificent ruin is a glorious monument. Upon my word, cried Albert, you must have been a very entertaining companion alone, or all but alone with a beautiful woman in such a place of sentiment as the Colosseum, and yet to find nothing better at talk about than the dead? All I can say is if ever I should get such a chance... The living should be my theme. And you will probably find your theme ill-chosen. But, said Albert, breaking in upon his discourse, never mind the past. Let us only remember the present. Are you not going to keep your promise of introducing me to the fair subject of our remarks? Certainly, directly the curtain falls on the stage. What a confounded time this first act takes. I believe on my soul that they never mean to finish it. Oh, yes, they will. Only listen to that charming finale. How exquisitely Coselli sings his part. But what an awkward, inelegant fellow he is. Well, then, what do you say to La Specia? 
And did you ever see anything more perfect than her acting? Well, you know, my dear fellow, when one has been accustomed to Malibran and Sontag, such singers as these don't make the same impression on you. They perhaps do on others. At least you must admire Mariani's style and execution. I never fancied men of his dark, ponderous appearance singing with a voice like a woman's. My good friend, said Franz, turning to him, while Albert continued to point his glass at every box in the theatre. You seem determined not to approve. You are really too difficult to please. The curtain at length fell on the performances to the infinite satisfaction of the Viscount of Morcerf, who seized his hat, rapidly passed his fingers through his hair, arranged his cravat and wristbands, and signified to France that he was waiting for him to lead the way. Franz, who had mutely interrogated the Countess, and received from her a gracious smile in token that he would be welcome, sought not to retard the gratification of Albert's eager impatience, but began at once the tour of the house, closely followed by Albert, who availed himself of the few minutes required to reach the opposite side of the theatre to settle the height and smoothness of his collar and to arrange the lapels of his coat. This important task was just completed as they arrived at the Countess's box. At the knock, the door was immediately opened, and the young man, who was seated beside the Countess, in obedience to the Italian custom, instantly rose and surrendered his place to the strangers, who in turn would be expected to retire upon the arrival of other visitors. France presented Albert as one of the most distinguished young men of the day, both as regarded his position in society and extraordinary talents. Nor did he say more than the truth, for in Paris and the circle in which the Viscount moved, he was looked upon and cited as a model of perfection. France added that his companion, deeply grieved at having been prevented the honour of being presented to the Countess during her sojourn in Paris, was most anxious to make up for it, and had requested him, France, to remedy the past misfortune by conducting him to her box, and concluded by asking pardon for his presumption in having taken it upon himself to do so. The Countess, in reply, bowed gracefully to Albert, and extended her hand with cordial kindness to France. Then, inviting Albert to take the vacant seat beside her, she recommended France take the next vest, if he wished to view the ballet, and pointed to the one behind her own chair. Albert was soon deeply engrossed in discoursing upon Paris and Parisian matters, speaking to the Countess of the various persons they both knew there. Franz perceived how completely he was in his element, and unwilling to interfere with the pleasure he so evidently felt, took up Albert's glasses, and began in his turn to survey the audience. Sitting alone, in the front of a box immediately opposite, but situated on the third row, was a woman of exquisite beauty, dressed in a Greek costume, which evidently, from the ease and grace with which she wore it, was her national attire. Behind her, but in deep shadow, was the outline of a masculine figure, but the features of this latter personage it was not possible to distinguish. Franz could not forbear breaking in upon the apparently interesting conversation passing between the Countess and Albert to inquire of the former if she knew who was the fair Albanian opposite, since beauty such as hers was well worthy of being observed by either sex. "'All I can tell you about her,' replied the Countess, "'is that she has been at Rome since the beginning of the season. "'For I saw her where she now sits, the very first night of the season, "'and since then she has never missed a performance. "'Sometimes she is accompanied by the person who is now with her, "'and at others she is merely attended by a black servant. "'And what do you think of her personal appearance?' Oh, I consider her perfectly lovely. She is just my idea of what Medora must have been. Franz and the Countess exchanged a smile, and then the latter resumed her conversation with Albert, 
while France returned to his previous survey of the house and company. The curtain rose on the ballet, which was one of those excellent specimens of the Italian school, admirably arranged and put on the stage by Henri, who has established for himself a great reputation throughout Italy for his taste and skill in the choreographic art, one of those masterly productions of grace, method and elegance, in which the whole corps de ballet, from the principal dancers to the humblest supernumerary, are all engaged on the stage at the same time, and a hundred and fifty persons may be seen exhibiting the same attitude or elevating the same arm or leg with a simultaneous movement that would lead you to suppose that but one mind, one act of volition, influenced the moving mass. The ballet was called Poliska. However much the ballet might have claimed his attention, France was too deeply occupied with the beautiful Greek to take any note of it, while she seemed to experience an almost childlike delight in watching it, her eager animated looks contrasting strongly with the utter indifference of her companion, who during the whole time the piece lasted, never even moved, not even when the furious crashing din produced by the trumpets, cymbals, and Chinese bells sounded their loudest from the orchestra. Of this he took no heed, but was, as far as appearances might be trusted, enjoying soft repose and bright celestial dreams. The ballet at length came to a close, and the curtain fell amid the loud, unanimous plaudits of an enthusiastic and delighted audience. Owing to the very judicious plan of dividing the two acts of the opera with a ballet, the pauses between the performances are very short. The singers in the opera, having time to repose themselves and change their costume, when necessary, while the dancers are executing their pirouettes and exhibiting their graceful steps. The overture to the second act began, and at the first sound of the leader's bow across his violin, Franz observed the sleeper slowly arise and approach the Greek girl, who turned around to say a few words to him, and then, leaning forward again on the railing of her box, she became as absorbed as before in what was going on. The countenance of the person who had addressed her remained so completely in the shade that though Franz tried his utmost, he could not distinguish a single feature. The curtain rose, and the attention of Franz was attracted by the actors, and his eyes turned from the box containing the Greek girl and her strange companion to watch the business of the stage. Most of my readers are aware that the second act of Parisina opens with the celebrated and effective duet in which Parisina, while sleeping, betrays to Azzo the secret of her love for Hugo. The injured husband goes through all the emotions of jealousy until conviction seizes on his mind, and then in a frenzy of rage and indignation he awakens his guilty wife to tell her that he knows her guilt and to threaten her with his vengeance. This duet is one of the most beautiful, expressive and terrible conceptions that has ever emanated from the fruitful pen of Donizetti. France now listened to it for the third time, yet its notes, so tenderly expressive and fearfully grand as the wretched husband and wife give vent to their different griefs and passions, thrill through the soul of France with an effect equal to his first emotions upon hearing it. Excited beyond his usual calm demeanour, France rose with the audience and was about to join the loud, enthusiastic applause that followed, but suddenly his purpose was arrested. His hands fell by his sides and the half-uttered bravos expired on his lips. The occupant of the box in which the Greek girl sat appeared to share the universal admiration that prevailed, for he left his seat to stand up in front, so that his countenance, being fully revealed, France had no difficulty in recognising him as the mysterious inhabitant of Monte Cristo, and the very same person he had encountered the preceding evening in the ruins of the Colosseum, and whose voice and figure had seemed so familiar to him. All doubt of his identity was now at an end. His singular host evidently resided at Rome. The surprise and agitation occasioned by this full confirmation of France's former suspicion 
had no doubt imparted a corresponding expression to his features. For the Countess, after gazing with a puzzled look at his face, burst into a fit of laughter and begged to know what had happened. A countess, returned Franz, totally unheeding her raillery. I asked you a short time or since if you knew any particulars respecting the Albanian lady. I must now beseech you to inform me who and what is her husband. Nay, answered the countess, I know no more of him than yourself. Perhaps you never before noticed him. What a question! So truly French! Do you not know that we Italians have eyes only for the man we love? True, replied Franz. All I can say is, continued the Countess, taking up the lorgnette and directing it toward the box in question, that the gentleman whose history I am unable to furnish seems to me as though he had just been dug up. He looks more like a corpse permitted by some friendly grave-digger to quit his tomb for a while and revisit this earth of ours than anything human. How ghastly pale he is! Oh, he is always as colourless as you now see him, said Franz. Then you know him, almost screamed the Countess. Oh, pray do, for heaven's sake, tell us all about it. Is he a vampire or a resuscitated corpse or what? I fancy I have seen him before, and I even think he recognises me. And I can well understand, said the Countess, shrugging up her beautiful shoulders, as though an involuntary shudder passed through her veins, that those who have seen once that man will never be likely to forget him. The sensation experienced by Franz was evidently not peculiar to himself. Another and wholly uninterested person felt the same unaccountable awe and misgiving, well, inquired Franz, after the Countess had a second time directed her lorgnette at the box, what do you think of our opposite neighbour? Why, that he is no other than Lord Ruthven himself, in a living form. This fresh allusion to Byron drew a smile to Franz's countenance. Although he could but allow that if anything was likely to induce belief in the existence of vampires, it would be the presence of such a man as the mysterious personage before him. I must positively find out who and what he is, said Franz, rising from his seat. No, no, cried the Countess. You must not leave me. I depend upon you to escort me home. Oh, indeed, I cannot permit you to go. Is it possible, whispered Franz, that you entertain any fear? I'll tell you, answered the Countess. Baron had the most perfect belief in the existence of vampires, and even assured me that he had seen them. The description he gave me perfectly corresponds with the features and character of the man before us. Oh, he is the exact personification of what I have been led to expect. The coal black hair, large, bright, glittering eyes in which a wild, unearthly fire seems burning, the same ghastly paleness. Then observe, too, that the woman with him is altogether unlike all others of her sex. She is a foreigner, a stranger. Nobody knows who she is or where she comes from. No doubt she belongs to the same horrible race he does, and is, like himself, a dealer in magical arts. I entreat of you not to go near him, at least to-night, and if to-morrow your curiosity still continues as great, pursue your researches if you will. But to-night you neither can nor shall, for that purpose I mean to keep you all to myself. Franz protested he could not defer his pursuit till the following day, for many reasons. Listen to me, said the Countess, and do not be so very headstrong. I am going home. I have a party at my house to-night and therefore cannot possibly remain till the end of the opera. Now I cannot for one instant believe you so devoid of gallantry as to refuse a lady your escort when she even condescends to ask you for it. There was nothing else left for France to do but to take up his hat, open the door of the box and offer the Countess his arm. 
It was quite evident by her manner that her uneasiness was not feigned, and Franz himself could not resist a feeling of superstitious dread. So much the stronger in him, as it arose from a variety of corroborative recollections, while the terror of the Countess sprang from an instinctive belief, originally created in her mind by the wild tales she had listened to till she believed them truths. Franz could even feel her arm tremble as he assisted her into the carriage. Upon arriving at her hotel, Franz perceived that she had deceived him when she spoke of expecting company. On the contrary, her own return before the appointed hour seemed greatly to astonish the servants. "'Excuse my little subterfuge,' said the Countess in reply to her companion's half-reproachful observation on the subject. "'But that horrid man had made me feel quite uncomfortable, and I long to be alone, that I might compose my startled mind.' Franz essayed to smile. "'Nay,' said she, "'do not smile. It ill accords with the expression of your countenance.' and I am sure it does not spring from your heart. However, promise me one thing. What is it? Promise me, I say. I will do anything you desire, except relinquish my determination of finding out who this man is. I have more reasons than you can imagine for desiring to know who he is, from whence he came, and whither he is going. Where he comes from, I am ignorant but I can readily tell you where he is going to, and that is down below, without the least doubt. Let us only speak of the promise you wish me to make, said Franz. Well then, you must give me your word to return immediately to your hotel and make no attempt to follow this man tonight. There are certain affinities between the persons we quit and those we meet afterwards. For heaven's sake, do not serve as a conductor between that man and me. Pursue your chase after him tomorrow, as eagerly as you please, but never bring him near me, if you would not see me die of terror. And now, good night. Go to your rooms and try to sleep away all the recollections of this evening. For my own part, I am quite sure I shall not be able to close my eyes. So saying, the Countess quitted France leaving him unable to decide whether she were merely amusing herself at his expense, or whether her fears and agitations were genuine. Upon his return to the hotel, Franz found Albert in his dressing gown and slippers, listlessly extended on a sofa, smoking a cigar. "'My dear fellow,' cried he, springing up, "'is it really you? Why, I did not expect to see you before tomorrow. "'My dear Albert,' replied Franz, I am glad of this opportunity to tell you once and forever that you entertain a most erroneous notion concerning Italian women. I should have thought the continual failures you have met with in all your own love affairs might have taught you better by this time. Upon my soul, these women would puzzle the very devil to read them aright. Why, here they give you their hand. They press yours in return. They keep up a whispering conversation. Permit you to accompany them home. Why, if a Parisian were to indulge in a quarter of these marks of flattering attention, a reputation would be gone forever. And the very reason why the women of this fine country put so little restraint on their words and actions is because they live so much in public and have really nothing to conceal. Besides, you must have perceived that the Countess was really alarmed. At what? At the sight of that respectable gentleman sitting opposite to us in the same box, with the lovely Greek girl? Now for my part, I met them in the lobby after the conclusion of the piece. And hang me, if I can guess where you took your notions of the other world from. I can assure you that this hobgoblin of yours is a deuced fine-looking fellow, admirably dressed. Indeed, I feel quite sure, from the cut of his clothes, they are made by a first-rate Paris tailor, probably Blin or Human. He was rather too pale, certainly. But then, you know, paleness is always looked upon as a strong proof of aristocratic descent and distinguished breeding. Franz smiled, for he well remembered 
that Albert particularly prided himself on the entire absence of colour in his own complexion. "'Well, that tends to confirm my own ideas,' said Franz, "'that the Countess's suspicions were destitute alike of sense and reason. "'Did he speak in your hearing, and did you catch any of his words?' "'I did, but they were uttered in the Romaic dialect. "'I knew that from the mixture of Greek words. "'I don't know whether I ever told you that when I was at college "'I was rather, rather strong in Greek.' He spoke the Romaic language, did he? I think so. That settles it, murmured Franz. Tis he, past all doubt. What did you say? Nothing, nothing, but tell me, what were you thinking about when I came in? Oh, I was arranging a little surprise for you. Indeed, of what nature? Why, you know it is quite impossible to procure a carriage. Certainly. And I also know that we have done all that human means afforded to endeavour to get one. Now then, in this difficulty a bright idea has flashed across my brain. Franz looked at Albert as though he had not much confidence in the suggestions of his imagination. I tell you what, Sir Franz, cried Albert, you deserve to be called out for such a misgiving and incredulous glance as that you are pleased to bestow on me just now. And I promise to give you the satisfaction of a gentleman, if your scheme turns out as ingenious as you assert. Well then, hearken to me. I listen. You agree, do you not, that obtaining a carriage is out of the question? I do. Neither can we procure horses. True, we have offered any sum, but have failed. Well now, what do you say to a cart? I dare say such a thing might be had. Very possibly. And a pair of oxen? As easily found as the cart. Then you see, my good fellow, with a cart and a couple of oxen, our business can be managed. The cart must be tastefully ornamented, and if you and I dress ourselves as Neapolitan reapers, we might get up a striking tableau after the manner of that splendid picture by Leopold Robert. It would add greatly to the effect if the Countess would join us in the costume of a peasant from Puzzoli or Sorrento. Our group would then be quite complete, more especially as the Countess is quite beautiful enough to represent a Madonna. Well, said Franz, this time, Albert, I am bound to give you credit for having hit upon a most capital idea. And quite a national one, too, replied Albert with a gratified pride. A mere mask borrowed from our own festivities. Ha, <laughs> ha, ye Romans, ye thought to make us unhappy strangers, trot at the heels of your processions like so many lazzaroni, because no carriages or horses are to be had in your beggarly city. But you don't know us. When we can't have one thing, we invent another. And have you communicated your triumphant idea to anybody? Only to our host. Upon my return home, I sent for him, and I then explained to him what I wished to procure. He assured me that nothing would be easier than to furnish all I desired. One thing I was sorry for, when I bade him have the horns of the oxen gilded, he told me there would not be time, as it would require three days to do that. So, you see, we must do without this uh, little uh, superfluity. And where is he now? Who? Our host. Gone out in search of our equipage. By tomorrow it might be too late. Then he will be able to give us an answer tonight. Oh, I expect him every minute. At this instant the door opened and the head of Signor Pastrini appeared. A permesso? inquired he. Certainly, certainly, cried Franz. Come in, mine host. Now then, asked Albert eagerly, have you found the desired cart and oxen? Better than that, replied Signor Pastrini with the air of a man perfectly well satisfied with himself. Take care, my worthy host, said Albert. Better is a sure enemy to well. Let your excellencies only leave the matter to me, 
returned Signor Pastrini in a tone indicative of unbounded self-confidence. "'But what have you done?' asked Franz. "'Speak out, there's a worthy fellow.' "'Your excellencies are aware,' responded the landlord, swelling with importance, "'that the Count of Monte Cristo is living on the same floor with yourselves.' "'I should think we did know it,' exclaimed Albert. "'Since it is owing to that circumstance "'that we are packed into these small rooms "'like two poor students in the back streets of Paris.' "'When, then, the Count of Monte Cristo, "'hearing of the dilemma in which you are placed, "'has sent to offer you seats in his carriage, "'and two places at his window in the Palazzo Rospoli.' "'The friends looked at each other with unutterable surprise. "'But do you think,' asked Albert, "'that we ought to accept such offers from a perfect stranger? "'What sort of person is this Count of Monte Cristo?' "'asked Franz of his host. "'A very great nobleman, but whether Maltese or Sicilian, I cannot exactly say. But this I know, that he is a noble as a Borghese, and rich as a gold mine. It seems to me, said Franz, speaking in an undertone to Albert, that if this person merited the high panegyrics of our landlord, he would have conveyed his invitation through another channel, and not permitted it to be brought to us in this unceremonious way. He would have written, or... At this instant, someone knocked at the door. "'Come in,' said Franz. A servant wearing a livery of considerable style and richness appeared at the threshold, and placing two cards in the landlord's hands, who forthwith presented them to the two young men, he said, "'Please, to deliver these from the Count of Monte Cristo, to Vicomte Albert de Morcerf, and Monsieur Franz de Pinay. "'The Count of Monte Cristo,' continued the servant, begs these gentlemen's permission to wait upon them as their neighbour, and he will be honoured by an intimation of what time they will please to receive him. Faith, France, whispered Albert, there is not much to find fault with here. Tell the Count, replied France, that we will do ourselves the pleasure of calling on him. The servant bowed and retired. "'That is what I call an elegant mode of attack,' said Albert. "'You were quite correct in what you said, Signor Pastrini. "'The Count of Monte Cristo is unquestionably a man of first-rate breeding and knowledge of the world.' "'Then you accept his offer,' said the host. "'Of course we do,' replied Albert. "'Still, I must own, I am sorry to be obliged to give up the cart and the group of reapers.' It would have produced such an effect. And were it not for the windows at the Palazzo Rospoli by way of recompense for the less of our beautiful scheme, I don't know but what I should have held on by my original plan. What say you, Franz? Oh, I agree with you. The windows in the Palazzo Rospoli alone decided me. The truth was that the mention of two places in the Palazzo Rospoli had recalled to France the conversation he had overheard the preceding evening in the ruins of the Colosseum between the mysterious unknown and the Trastevere, in which the stranger in the cloak had undertaken to obtain the freedom of a condemned criminal. And if this muffled-up individual proved, as France felt sure he would, the same as the person he had just seen in the Teatro Argentino, then he should be able to establish his identity and also to prosecute his researches respecting him with perfect facility and freedom. Franz passed the night in confused dreams, respecting the two meetings he had already had with his mysterious tormentor, and in waking speculations as to what the morrow would produce. The next day must clear up every doubt, and unless his near neighbour and would-be friend, the Count of Monte Cristo, possessed the Ring of Guige, and by its power was able to render himself invisible, it was very certain he could not escape this time. Eight o'clock found France up and dressed, while Albert, who had not the same motives for early rising, was still soundly asleep. The first act of France was to summon his landlord, who presented himself with his accustomed obsequiousness. "'Pray, Signor Pastrini,' asked France, 
Is not some execution appointed to take place today? Yes, your excellency. But if your reason for inquiry is that you may procure a window to view it from, you are much too late. Oh no, answered Franz. I had no such intention, and even if I had felt a wish to witness the spectacle, I might have done so from Monte Pincio. Could I not? Ah, exclaimed mine host, I did not think it likely your excellency would have chosen to mingle with such a rabble as are always collected on that hill, which indeed they consider as exclusively belonging to themselves. Very possibly I may not go, answered Franz. But in case I feel disposed, give me some particulars of today's executions. What particulars would your excellency like to hear? Why, the number of persons condemned to suffer, their names and description of the death they are to die. That happens just lucky, your excellency. Only a few minutes ago they brought me the tavoletas. What are they? A sort of a wooden tablets hung up at the corners of the streets the evening before an execution, on which is pasted up a paper containing the names of the condemned persons, their crimes and the mode of punishment. The reason for so publicly announcing all this is that all good and faithful Catholics may offer up their prayers for the unfortunate culprits, and above all beseech of heaven to grant them a sincere repentance. And these tablets are brought to you that you may add your prayers to those of the faithful, are they? asked Franz somewhat incredulously. Oh dear no, your excellency, I have not a time for anybody's affairs but my own and those of my honourable guests. But I make an agreement with the man who pastes up the papers, and he brings them to me as he would the playbills, that in case any person staying at my hotel should like to witness an execution, he may obtain every requisite information concerning the time and place, etc. Upon my word, that is a most delicate attention on your part, Signor Pastrini, cried Franz. Why, your excellency, returned the landlord, chuckling and rubbing his hands with infinite complacency, I think I may take upon myself to say I neglect nothing to deserve the support and patronage of the noble visitors to this poor hotel. I see that plainly enough, my most excellent host, and you may rely upon me to proclaim so striking a proof of your attention to your guests wherever I go. Meanwhile, oblige me by a sight of one of those uh, tavoletas. Nothing can be easier than to comply with your excellency's wish, said the landlord, opening the door of the chamber. I have caused one to be placed on the landing, close by your apartment. Then, taking the tablet from the wall, he handed it to Franz, who read as follows. The public is informed that on Wednesday, February 23rd, being the first day of the carnival, executions will take place in the Piazza del Popolo by order of the Tribunal of the Rota, of two persons named Andrea Rondola and Peppino, otherwise called Rocca Priori. The former found guilty of the murder of a venerable and exemplary priest named Don Cesare Torlini, canon of the church at St. John Lateran, and the latter convicted of being an accomplice of the atrocious and sanguinary bandit Luigi Vampa and his band. The first named malefactor will be subjected to the Matsuola, the second culprit beheaded. The prayers of all good Christians are entreated for these unfortunate men that it may please God to awaken them to a sense of their guilt and to grant them a hearty and sincere repentance for their crimes. This was precisely what Franz had heard the evening before in the ruins of the Colosseum. No part of the programme differed. The names of the condemned persons, their crimes and mode of punishment, all agreed with his previous information. In all probability, therefore, the Transteverin was no other than the bandit Luigi Vampa himself, and the man shrouded in the mantle, the same he had known as Simbad the Sailor, but who no doubt was still pursuing his philanthropic expedition in Rome, as he had already done at Porto Vecchio and Tunis. Time was getting on, however, and France deemed it advisable to awaken Albert. 
but at the moment he prepared to proceed to his chamber, his friend entered the room in perfect costume for the day. The anticipated delights of the carnival had so run in his head as to make him leave his pillow long before his usual hour. Now, my excellent Signor Pastrini, said Franz, addressing his landlord, since we are both ready, do you think we may proceed at once to visit the Count of Monte Cristo? Most assuredly, replied he. The Count of Monte Cristo is always an early riser, and I can answer for his having been up these two hours. Then you really consider we shall not be intruding if we pay our respects to him directly? Oh, I am quite sure. I will take all the blame on myself if you find I have led you into an error. Well then, if it be so, are you ready, Albert? Perfectly. Let us go and return our best thanks for his courtesy. Yes, let us do so. The landlord preceded the friends across the landing, which was all that separated them from the apartments of the Count, rang at the bell and, upon the door being opened by a servant, said, Ay, Signori Francesi. The domestic bowed respectfully and invited them to enter. They passed through two rooms furnished in a luxurious manner they had not expected to see under the roof of Signor Pastrini, and were shown into an elegantly fitted-up drawing-room. The richest turkey carpets covered the floor, and the softest and most inviting couches, easy chairs and sofas, offered their high-piled and yielding cushions to such as desired repose or refreshment. Splendid paintings by the first masters were ranged against the walls, intermingled with magnificent trophies of war, while heavy curtains of costly tapestry were suspended before the different doors of the room. "'If your excellencies will please to be seated,' said the man, "'I will let the Count know that you are here.' And with these words he disappeared behind one of the tapestried portières. As the door opened, the sound of a guzla reached the ears of the young men, but was mostly immediately lost, for the rapid closing of the door merely allowed one rich swell of harmony to enter. Franz and Albert looked inquiringly at each other, then at the gorgeous furnishings of the apartment. Everything seemed more magnificent at a second view than it had done at their first rapid survey. "'Well,' said Franz to his friend, "'what think you of all this?' "'Why, upon my soul, my dear fellow,' It strikes me that our elegant and attentive neighbour must either be some successful stock-jobber who has speculated in the fall of the Spanish funds, or some prince travelling incog. Hush, hush, replied Franz. We shall ascertain who and what he is. He comes. As Franz spoke, he heard the sound of a door turning on its hinges, and almost immediately afterwards the tapestry was drawn aside, and the owner of all these riches stood before the two young men. Albert instantly rose to meet him, but Franz remained in a manner spellbound on his chair, for in the person of him who had just entered he recognised not only the mysterious visitant to the Colosseum and the occupant of the box at the Teatro Argentino, but also his extraordinary host of Monte Cristo. End of chapter 34。Chapter 35 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35 La Mazzolata. Gentlemen, said the Count of Monte Cristo as he entered, I pray you excuse me for suffering my visit to be anticipated, but I feared to disturb you by presenting myself earlier at your apartments. Besides, you sent me word that you would come to me, and I have held myself at your disposal. Franz and I have to thank you a thousand times, Count, returned Albert. You extricated us from a great dilemma, and we were on the point of inventing a very fantastic vehicle 
when your friendly invitation reached us. Indeed, returned the Count, motioning the two young men to sit down. It was the fault of that blockhead Pastrini that I did not sooner assist you in your distress. He did not mention a syllable of your embarrassment to me, when he knows that alone and isolated as I am, I seek every opportunity of making the acquaintance of my neighbours. As soon as I learned I could in any way assist you, I most eagerly seized the opportunity of offering my services. The two young men bowed. Franz had, as yet, found nothing to say. He had come to no determination, and as nothing in the Count's manner manifested the wish that he should recognise him, he did not know whether to make any allusion to the past, or wait until he had more proof. Besides, although sure it was he who had been in the box the previous evening, he could not be equally positive that this was the man he had seen at the Colosseum. He resolved, therefore, to let things take their course without making any direct overture to the Count. Moreover, he had this advantage. He was master of the Count's secret, while the Count had no hold on France, who had nothing to conceal. However, he resolved to lead the conversation into a subject which might possibly clear up his doubts. "'A Count,' said he, "'you have offered us places in your carriage.' and at your windows in the Rospoli Palace. Can you tell us where we can obtain a sight of the Piazza del Popolo? Ah, said the Count, negligently looking attentively at Morcerf, is there not something like an execution upon the Piazza del Popolo? Yes, returned Franz, finding that the Count was coming to the point he wished. Stay, I think I told my steward yesterday to attend to this, Perhaps I can render you this slight a service also. He extended his hand and rang the bell thrice. Did you ever occupy yourself, said he to France, with the employment of time and the means of simplifying the summoning your servants? I have. When I ring once, it is for my valet, twice for my maggiordomo, thrice for my steward. Thus I do not waste a minute or a word. Here he is. A man of about forty-five or fifty entered, exactly resembling the smuggler who had introduced France into the cavern, but he did not appear to recognise him. It was evident he had his orders. Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count, you have procured me windows looking on the Piazza del Popolo as I ordered you yesterday? Yes, Excellency, returned the steward, but it was very late. "'Did I not tell you I wished for one?' replied the Count, frowning. "'And your Excellency has one, which was let to Prince Lobenieff. "'But I was obliged to pay a hundred. "'That will do, that will do, Monsieur Bertuccio. "'Spare these gentlemen all such domestic arrangements. "'You have the window. That is sufficient. "'Give orders to the coachman, and be in readiness on the stairs to conduct us to it.' "'The steward bowed.' and was about to quit the room. Ah, continued the Count, be good enough to ask Pastrini if he has received the tavoletta and if he can send us an account of the execution. There is no need to do that, said Franz, taking out his tablets, for I saw the account and copied it down. Very well, you can retire, Signor Bituccio, but let us know when breakfast is ready. These gentlemen added he, turning to the two friends. Will, I trust, do me the honour to breakfast with me? Uh, but, my dear Count, uh, said Albert, we shall abuse your kindness. Not at all. On the contrary, you will give me great pleasure. You will, one or other of you, perhaps both, return it to me at Paris. Signor Bertuccio, lay covers for three. He then took Francis' tablets out of his hand, we announce, he read, in the same tone with which he would have read a newspaper, that today, the 23rd of February, will be executed Andrea Rondolo, guilty of murder on the person of the respected and venerated Don Cesare Torlini, canon of the Church of San John Letteran, and a Peppino called Rocca Priori, convicted of complicity with the detestable bandit Luigi Vampa and the men of his band. 
Hmm. The first will be mazzolato. The second, decapitato. Yes, continued the Count. It was at first arranged in this way, but I think since yesterday some change has taken place in the order of the ceremony. Really, said Franz. Yes, I passed the evening at the Cardinal Rospelliosi's, and there mention was made of something like a pardon for one of the two men. For André Rondolo? asked Franz. No, replied the Count, carelessly. For the other, he glanced at the tablets as if to recall the name, for a Peppino called Rocca Priori. You are thus deprived of seeing a man guillotined. But the Matsuola still remains, which is a very curious punishment when seen for the first time, and even the second, while the other, as you must know, is very simple. The mandala never fails, never trembles, never strikes thirty times ineffectually, like the soldier who beheaded the Count of Chalet, and whose tender mercy Richelieu had doubtless recommended the sufferer. Ah, added the Count in a contemptuous tone, do not tell me of European punishments. They are in their infancy, or rather the old age of cruelty. Really, Count, replied Franz, one would think that you had studied the different tortures of all the nations of the world. There are at least a few that I have not seen, said the Count coldly. And you take pleasure in beholding these dreadful spectacles? My first sentiment was horror, the second indifference, the third curiosity. Curiosity, that is a terrible word. Why so? In life our greatest preoccupation is death. Is it not then curious to study the different ways by which the soul and body can part, and how according to their different character temperaments, and even the different customs of their countries, different persons bear the transition from life to death, from existence to annihilation? As for myself, I can assure you of one thing. The more men you see die, the easier it becomes to die yourself. And in my opinion, death may be a torture, but it is not an expiation. I do not quite understand you, replied Franz. Pray explain your meaning, for you excite my curiosity to the highest pitch. Listen, said the Count, and deep hatred mounted to his face as the blood would to the face of any other. If a man had by unheard-of and excruciating tortures destroyed your father, your mother, your betrothed, a being who, when torn from you, left a desolation, a wound that never closes in your breast. Do you think the reparation that society gives you insufficient when it interposes the knife of the guillotine between the base of the occiput and the trapezal muscles of the murderer, and allows him who has caused us years of moral sufferings to escape with a few moments of physical pain? Yes, I know, said Franz, that human justice is insufficient to console us. She can give blood in return for blood, that is all. But you must demand from her only what it is in her power to grant. I will put another case to you, continued the Count, that where society attacked by the death of a person, avenges death by death. But are there not a thousand tortures by which a man may be made to suffer without society taking the least cognizance of them, or offering him even the insufficient means of vengeance, of which we have just spoken? Are there not crimes for which the impalement of the Turks, the augurs of the Persians, the stake and the brand of the Iraqi Indians are inadequate tortures, and which are unpunished by society. Answer me. Do not these crimes exist? Yes, answered Franz, and it is to punish them that dueling is tolerated. Ah, dueling, cried the Count. A pleasant manner, upon my soul, of arriving at your end when that end is vengeance. A man has carried off your mistress. A man has seduced your wife, a man has dishonoured your daughter, 
He has rendered the whole life of one who had the right to expect from heaven that portion of happiness God has promised to every one of his creatures, an existence of misery and infamy. And you think you are avenged because you send a ball through the head or pass a sword through the breast of that man who has planted madness in your brain and despair in your heart? And remember, moreover, that it is often he who comes off victorious from the strife, absolved of all crime in the eyes of the world. No, no, continued the Count. Had I to avenge myself, it is not thus I would take revenge. Then you disapprove of duelling? You would not fight a duel? asked Albert in his turn, astonished at this strange theory. Ah, uh, yes, replied the Count. Understand me, I would fight a duel for a trifle, for an insult, for a blow, and the more so that, thanks to my skill in all bodily exercises, and the indifference to the danger I have gradually acquired, I should be almost certain to kill my man. Oh, I would fight for such a cause, but in return for slow, profound, eternal torture, I would give back the same, were it possible. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as the Orientalists say, our masters in everything, those favoured creatures who have formed for themselves a life of dreams and a paradise of realities. But, said Franz to the Count, with this theory, which renders you at once judge and executioner of your own cause, it would be difficult to adopt a course that would forever prevent you falling under the power of the law. Hatred is blind. Rage carries you away, and he who pours our vengeance runs the risk of tasting a bitter draught. Yes, if he be poor and inexperienced. Not if he be rich and skilful. Besides, uh, the worst that could happen to him would be the punishment of which we have already spoken, and which the philanthropic French Revolution has substituted for being torn to pieces by horses or broken on the wheel. What matters this punishment, as long as he is avenged? On my word, I almost regret that in all probability this miserable Peppino will not be beheaded, as you might have had an opportunity of seeing how short a time the punishment lasts, and whether it is worth even mentioning, but really this is most singular conversation for the carnival, gentlemen. How did it arise? Ah! I recollect you asked for a place at my window. You shall have it. But let us first sit down to table, for here comes the servant to inform us that breakfast is ready. As he spoke, a servant opened one of the four doors of the apartment, saying, Al suo comodo. The two young men arose and entered the breakfast room. During the meal, which was excellent and admirably served, Franz looked repeatedly at Albert, in order to observe the impressions which he doubted not have been made on him by the words of their entertainer, but whether with his usual carelessness he had paid but little attention to him, whether the explanation of the Count of Monte Cristo with regard to duelling had satisfied him, or whether the events which Franz knew of had had their effect on him alone. He remarked that his companion did not pay the least regard to them, but on the contrary, ate like a man who for the last four or five months had been condemned to partake of Italian cookery, that is, the worst in the world. As for the Count, he just touched the dishes. He seemed to fulfil the duties of a host by sitting down with his guests, and awaited their departure to be served with some strange or more delicate food. This brought back to France, in spite of himself, the recollection of the terror with which the Count had inspired the Countess, and her firm conviction that the man in the opposite box was a vampire. At the end of the breakfast, Franz took out his watch. Well, said the Count, what are you doing? You must excuse us, Count, returned Franz, but we still have much to do. What may that be? We have no masks, and it is absolutely necessary to procure them. Do not concern yourself about that. We have, I think, a private room in the Piazza del Popolo. I will have whatever costumes you choose brought to us, and you can dress there. After the execution, cried Franz. 
before or after, whichever you please. Opposite the scaffold? The scaffold forms part of the fate. A count, I have reflected on the matter, said Franz. I thank you for your courtesy, but I shall content myself with accepting a place in your carriage and at your window at the Rospoli Palace, and I leave you at liberty to dispose of my place at the Piazza del Popolo. But I warn you, you will lose a very curious sight, returned the Count. You will describe it to me, replied Franz, and the recital from your lips will make as great an impression on me as if I had witnessed it. I have more than once intended witnessing an execution, but I have never been able to make up my mind. And you, Albert? I, replied the Viscount, I saw Castaing executed, uh, but I think I was rather intoxicated that day, for I had acquitted the college the same morning, and we had passed the previous night at a tavern. Besides, uh, it is uh, no reason, because you have not seen an execution at Paris, uh, that you should not see one anywhere else. When you travel, it is to see everything. Think what a figure you will make when you are asked. How do they execute at Rome? And you reply, I do not know. And besides, they say that the culprit is an infamous scoundrel who killed with a log of wood a worthy canon who had brought him up like his own son. Diable, when a churchman is killed, it should be with a different weapon than a log especially when he has behaved like a father. If you went to Spain, would you not see the bullfight? Well, suppose it is a bullfight you are going to see. Recollect the ancient Romans of the circus, and the sports where they killed three hundred lions and a hundred men. Think of the eighty thousand applauding spectators, the sage matrons who took their daughters and the charming vestals, who made the thumb of their white hands the fatal sign that said, Come, dispatch the dying. Shall you go then, Albert? asked Franz. Ma foi, yes, like you. I hesitated, but the Count's eloquence decides me. Let us go then, said Franz, since you wish it. But on our way to the Piazza del Popolo, I wish to pass through the Corso. Is this possible, Count? On foot, yes. In a carriage, no. I will go on foot then. Is it important that you should go that way? Yes, there is something I wish to see. Well, we will go by the Corso. We will send the carriage to wait for us on the Piazza del Popolo, by the Strada del Babuino, for I shall be glad to pass myself through the Corso to see if some orders I have given have been executed. Excellency, said a servant opening the door, a man in the dress of a penitent wishes to speak to you. Ah, yes, sir, returned the Count. I know who he is. Gentlemen, will you return to the salon? You will find good cigars on the centre table. I will be with you directly. The young men rose and returned into the salon, while the Count, again apologising, left by another door. Albert, who was a great smoker, and who had considered it no small sacrifice to be deprived of the cigars of the Café de Paris, approached the table and uttered a cry of joy at perceiving some veritable puros. Well, asked Franz, what think you of the Count of Monte Cristo? What do I think? said Albert, evidently surprised at such a question from his companion. I think he is a delightful fellow, who does the honours of his table admirably, who has travelled much, read much. He is like a Brutus of the Stoic school, and moreover, added he, sending a volume of smoke up towards the ceiling, that he has excellent cigars. Such was Albert's opinion of the Count, and as France well knew that Albert professed never to form an opinion, except upon long reflection, he made no attempt to change it. But, said he, did you observe one very singular thing? What? How attentively he looked at you, at me? Yes, Albert reflected. Ah, he replied, sighing, that is not very surprising. I have been more than a year absent from Paris, and my clothes are of a most antiquated cut. The Count takes me for a provincial. The first opportunity you have, I'll deceive him, I beg, 
and tell him I am nothing of the kind. Franz smiled an instant after the Count entered. I am now quite at your service, gentlemen, said he. The carriage is going one way to the Piazza del Popolo, and we will go another, and, if you please, by the Corso. Take some more of the cigars, Monsieur de Morcerf. With all my heart, returned Albert, Italian cigars are horrible. When you come to Paris, I will return all this. I will not refuse. I intend going there soon, and since you allow me, I will pay you a visit. Come, we have not any time to lose. It is half past twelve. Let us set off. All three descended. The coachman received his master's orders and drove down the Via del Babuino. While the three gentlemen walked along the Piazza di Spagna and the Via Fratina, which led directly between the Fiano and Rospoli palaces, Francis's attention was directed towards the windows of that last palace, for he had not forgotten the signal agreed upon between the man in the mantle and the Transtavere peasant. "'Which are your windows?' asked he of the Count, with as much indifference as he could assume. "'The three last,' returned he, with a negligence evidently unaffected, for he could not imagine with what intention the question was put. Franz glanced rapidly towards the three windows— the side windows were hung with yellow damask, and the centre one with white damask and a red cross. The man in the mantle had kept his promise to the Transtaverin, and there could now be no doubt that he was the Count. The three windows were still untenanted, preparations were making on every side, chairs were placed, scaffolds were raised, and windows were hung with flags. The masks could not appear, the carriages could not move about but the masks were visible behind the windows, the carriages and the doors. Franz, Albert and the Count continued to descend the Corso. As they approached the Piazza del Popolo, the crowd became more dense, and above the heads of the multitude two objects were visible. The obelisk, surmounted by a cross, which marks the centre of the square, and in front of the obelisk, at the point where the three streets, del Babuino, del Corso and di Ripetta met, the two uprights of the scaffold between which glittered the curved knife of the mandaya. At the corner of the street they met the Count's steward, who was awaiting his master. The window, let at an exorbitant price, which the Count had doubtless wished to conceal from his guests, was on the second floor of the great palace, situated between the Via del Babuino and the Monte Pincio. It consisted, as we have said, of a small dressing-room opening into a bedroom, and when the door of communication was shut, the inmates were quite alone. On chairs were laid elegant masquerade costumes of blue and white satin. "'As you left the choice of your costumes to me,' said the Count to the two friends, "'I have had these bought, as they will be the most worn this year, and they are most suitable on account of the confetti, as they do not show the flower.' Franz heard the words of the Count, but imperfectly, and he perhaps did not fully appreciate this new attention to their wishes, for he was wholly absorbed by the spectacle that the Piazza del Popolo presented, and by the terrible instrument that was in the centre. It was the first time France had ever seen a guillotine. We say guillotine because the Roman mandaya is formed on almost the same model as the French instrument. The knife, which is shaped like a crescent that cuts with the convex side, falls from a less height, and that is all the difference. Two men, seated on the movable plank on which the victim is laid, were eating their breakfasts while waiting for the criminal. Their repast consisted apparently of bread and sausages. One of them lifted the plank, took out a flask of wine, drank some, then passed it to his companion. These two men were the executioner's assistants. At this sight Franz felt the perspiration start forth upon his brow, the prisoners transported the previous evening from the Carcere Nuovo to the little church of Santa Maria del Popolo, had passed the night each accompanied by two priests in a chapel closed by a grating, before which were two sentinels, who were relieved at intervals. A double line of cabiniers, placed on each side of the door of the church, reached to the scaffold and formed a circle around it, leaving a path about ten feet wide 
and around the guillotine a space of nearly a hundred feet. All the rest of the square was paved with heads. Many women held their infants on their shoulders, and thus the children had the best view. The Monte Pincio seemed a vast amphitheatre filled with spectators. The balconies of the two churches at the corner of the Via del Babuino and the Via di Ripetta were crammed. The steps even seemed a party-coloured sea that was impelled towards the portico. Every niche in the wall held its living statue. What the Count said was true. The most curious spectacle in life is that of death. And yet, instead of the silence and the solemnity demanded by the occasion, laughter and jests arose from the crowd. It was evident that the execution was, in the eyes of the people, only the commencement of the Carnival. Suddenly the tumult ceased, as if by magic, and the doors of the church opened. A brotherhood of penitents, clothed from head to foot in robes of grey sackcloth, with holes for the eyes and holding in their hands lighted tapers, appeared first. The chief marched at the head. Behind the penitents came a man of vast stature and proportions. He was naked, with the exception of cloth drawers, at the left side of which hung a large knife in a sheath, and he bore on his right shoulder a heavy iron sledgehammer. This man was the executioner. He had, moreover, sandals bound on his feet by cords. Behind the executioner came, in the order in which they were to die, first Peppino, and then Andrea. Each was accompanied by two priests. Neither had his eyes bandaged. Peppino walked with a firm step, doubtless aware of what awaited him. Andrea was supported by two priests. Each of them, from time to time, kissed the crucifix a confessor held out to them. At this sight alone, Franz felt his legs tremble under him. He looked at Albert. He was as white as his shirt, and mechanically cast away his cigar, although he had not half smoked it. The Count alone seemed unmoved. Nay more, a slight colour seemed striving to rise in his pale cheeks. His nostrils dilated like those of a wild beast that scents its prey, and his lips, half opened, disclosed his white teeth, small and sharp like those of a jackal. And yet his features wore an expression of smiling tenderness such as France had never before witnessed in them. His black eyes especially were full of kindness and pity. However, the two culprits advanced, and as they approached their faces became visible. Peppino was a handsome young man of four or five and twenty, bronzed by the sun. He carried his head erect, and seemed on the watch to see on which side his liberator would appear. Andrea was short and fat. His visage, marked with brutal cruelty, did not indicate age. He might be thirty. In prison he'd suffered his beard to grow, his head fell on his shoulder, his legs bent beneath him, and his movements were apparently automatic and unconscious. "'I thought,' said Franz to the Count, "'that you told me there would be but one execution.' "'I told you true,' replied he coldly. "'And yet here are two culprits.' "'Yes, but only one of these two is about to die. "'The other has many years to live.' If the pardon is to come, there is no time to lose. And a see, here it is, said the Count. At the moment when Peppino reached the foot of the Mandaya, a priest arrived in some haste, forced his way through the soldiers, and, advancing to the chief of the Brotherhood, gave him a folded paper. The piercing eye of Peppino had noticed all. The chief took the paper, unfolded it, and raising his hand, Heaven be praised! And his holiness also, said he in a loud voice, here is a pardon for one of the prisoners. A pardon, cried the people with one voice, a pardon. At this cry, Andrea raised his head. Pardon for whom, cried he. Peppino remained breathless. A pardon for Peppino, called Rocca Priori, said the principal friar and he passed the paper to the officer commanding the cabineers, who read and returned it to him. "'For Peppino!' cried Andrea, who seemed roused from the torpor in which he had been plunged. "'Why for him, and not for me? 
We ought to die together. I was promised he should die with me. You have no right to put me to death alone. I will not die alone. I will not. And he broke from the priests, struggling and raving like a wild beast, and striving desperately to break the cords that bound his hands. The executioner made a sign, and his two assistants leapt from the scaffold and seized him. What is going on? asked Franz of the Count, for, as all the talk was in the Roman dialect, he had not perfectly understood it. Do you not see, returned the Count, that this human creature who is about to die is furious that his fellow sufferer does not perish with him, and were he able, he would rather tear him to pieces with his teeth and nails than let him enjoy the life he himself is about to be deprived of. O oh, man! "'Man, a race of crocodiles!' cried the Count, extending his clinched hands toward the crowd. "'How well do I recognize you there, and that at all times you are worthy of yourselves!' Meanwhile Andrea and the two executioners were struggling on the ground, and he kept exclaiming, "'He ought to die! He shall die! I will not die alone!' "'Look, look!' cried the Count, seizing the young man's hands. "'Look, for on my soul it is curious!' Here is a man who had resigned himself to his fate, who was going to the scaffold to die, like a coward, it is true, but he was about to die without resistance. Do you know what gave him strength? Do you know what consoled him? It was that another partook of his punishment, that another partook of his anguish, that another was to die before him, lead two sheep to the butcher's, two oxen to the slaughterhouse, and make one of them understand that his companion will not die. The sheep will bleat for pleasure, the ox will bellow with joy. But man, man whom God created in his own image, man upon whom God has laid his first, his sole commandment, to love his neighbour, man to whom God has given a voice to express his thoughts. What is his first cry, when he hears his fellow man is saved. A blasphemy! Honour to man, this masterpiece of nature, this king of the creation! And the Count burst into a laugh, a terrible laugh, that showed he must have suffered horribly to be able thus to laugh. However, the struggle still continued, and it was dreadful to witness. The people all took part against Andrea, and twenty thousand voices cried, Put him to death! Put him to death! Franz sprang back, but the Count seized his arm and held him before the window. What are you doing? said he. Do you pity him? If you heard the cry of mad dog, you would take your gun, you would unhesitatingly shoot the poor beast, who, after all, was only guilty of having been bitten by another dog. And yet you pity a man, who, without being bitten by one of his race, has yet murdered his benefactor, and who now, unable to kill anyone, because his hands are bound, wishes to see his companion in captivity perish. No, no, look, look! The command was needless. Franz was fascinated by the horrible spectacle. The two assistants had borne Andrea to the scaffold, and there, in spite of his struggles, his bites and his cries, had forced him to his knees. During this time, the executioner had raised his mace and signed to them to get out of the way. The criminal strove to rise, but ere he had time, the mace fell on his left temple. A dull and heavy sound was heard, and the man dropped like an ox on his face and then turned over on his back. The executioner let fall his mace, drew his knife, and with one stroke opened his throat, and mounting on his stomach, stamped violently on it with his feet. At every stroke a jet of blood sprang from the wound. This time France could contain himself no longer, but sank, half fainting, into a seat. Albert, with his eyes closed, was standing grasping the window curtains. The Count was erect and triumphant, like the avenging angel. End of chapter 35
Chapter 36 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36 The Carnival at Rome. When Franz recovered his senses, he saw Albert drinking a glass of water, of which to judge from his pallor he stood in great need, and the Count, who was assuming his masquerade costume. He glanced mechanically towards the square. The scene was wholly changed. Scaffold, executioners, victims, all had disappeared. Only the people remained full of noise and excitement. The bell of Monte Cittorillo, which only sounds on the Pope's decease, and the opening of the carnival, was ringing a joyous peal. "'Well,' asked he of the Count, "'what has then happened?' "'Nothing,' replied the Count. Only, as you see, the carnival has commenced. Make haste and dress yourself. In fact, said Franz, this horrible scene has passed away like a dream. It is but a dream, a nightmare that has disturbed you. Yes, that I have suffered. But the culprit? This is a dream also. Only he has remained asleep while you have awakened. "'and who knows which of you is the most fortunate. "'But Peppino, what has become of him?' "'Peppino is a lad of sense, "'who, unlike most men, "'who are happy in proportion as they are noticed, "'was delighted to see that the general attention "'was directed towards his companion. "'He profited by this distraction "'to slip away among the crowd, "'without even thanking the worthy priests "'who accompanied him.' Decidedly, man is an ungrateful and egotistical animal. But dress yourself. See, Monsieur de Morcerf sets you the example. Albert was drawing on the satin pantaloon over his black trousers and varnished boots. Well, Albert, said Franz, do you feel much inclined to join the revels? Come, answer frankly. Ma foi, no, returned Albert. "'but I am really glad to have seen such a sight, "'and I understand what the Count said, "'that when you have once habituated yourself to a similar spectacle, "'it is the only one that causes you any emotion. "'Without reflecting that this is the only moment "'in which you can study character,' said the Count, "'on the steps of the scaffold death tears off the mask "'that has been worn through life, "'and the real visage is disclosed.' It must be allowed that Andrea was not very handsome, the hideous scoundrel. Come, dress yourselves, gentlemen, dress yourselves. Franz felt it would be ridiculous not to follow his two companions' example. He assumed his costume and fastened on the mask that scarcely equalled the pallor of his own face. Their toilet finished, they descended. The carriage awaited them at the door, filled with sweetmeats and bouquets. They fell into the line of carriages. It is difficult to form an idea of the perfect change that had taken place. Instead of the spectacle of gloomy and silent death, the Piazza del Popolo presented a spectacle of gay and noisy mirth and revelry. A crowd of masks flowed in from all sides, emerging from the doors, descending from the windows. From every street and every corner, drove carriages filled with clowns, harlequins, dominoes, mummers, pantomimists, transtaverins, knights and peasants, screaming, fighting, gesticulating, throwing eggs filled with flour, confetti, nosegays, attacking with their sarcasms and their missiles, friends and foes, companions and strangers, indiscriminately. And no one took offence, or did anything but laugh. France and Albert were like men who, to drive away a violent sorrow, have recourse to wine, and who, as they drink and become intoxicated, feel a thick veil drawn between the past and the present. They saw, or rather continued to see, the image of what they had witnessed, but little by little the general vertigo seized them, and they felt themselves obliged to take part in the noise and confusion. A handful of confetti that came from a neighbouring carriage and which, while it covered Morcerf and his two companions with dust, pricked his neck, and that portion of his face, uncovered by his mask like a hundred pins, 
incited him to join in the general combat in which all the masks around him were engaged. He rose in his turn, and seizing handfuls of confetti and sweetmeats with which the carriage was filled, cast them with all the force and skill he was master of. The strife had fairly begun, and the recollection of what they had seen half an hour before was gradually effaced from the young men's minds. So much were they occupied by the gay and glittering procession they now beheld. As for the Count of Monte Cristo, he had never for an instant shown any appearance of having been moved. Imagine the large and splendid Corso, bordered from one end to the other with lofty palaces, with their balconies hung with carpets and their windows with flags. At these balconies are three hundred thousand spectators, Romans, Italians, strangers from all parts of the world, the united aristocracy of birth, wealth, and genius. Lovely women, yielding to the influence of the scene, bend over their balconies, or lean from their windows and shower down confetti, which are returned by bouquets. The air seems darkened with the falling confetti and flying flowers. In the streets the lively crowd is dressed in the most fantastic costumes. Gigantic cabbages walk gravely about. Buffaloes' heads bellow from men's shoulders. Dogs walk on their hind legs. In the midst of all this, a mask is lifted, and, as in Callot's at Temptation of St. Anthony, a lovely face is exhibited, which we would fain follow, but from which we are separated by troops of fiends. This will give a faint idea of the carnival at Rome. At second turn, the Count stopped the carriage and requested permission to withdraw, leaving the vehicle at their disposal. Franz looked up. They were opposite the Rospoli Palace. At the centre window, the one hung with white damask with a red cross, was a blue domino, beneath which Franz's imagination easily pictured the beautiful Greek of the Argentina. Gentlemen, said the Count, springing out, when you are tired of being actors and wish to become spectators of this scene, you know you have a place at my windows. In the meantime, dispose of my coachman, my carriage, and my servants. We've forgotten to mention that the Count's coachman was attired in a bearskin, exactly resembling Audrey's in The Bear and the Pasha. And the two footmen behind were dressed up as green monkeys with spring masks, with which they made grimaces at everyone who passed. Franz thanked the Count for his attention. As for Albert, he was busily occupied throwing bouquets at a carriage full of Roman peasants that was passing near him. Unfortunately for him, the line of carriages moved on again, and while he descended the Piazza del Popolo, the other ascended towards the Palazzo di Venezia. "'Ah, oh, my dear fellow,' said he to Franz, "'he did not see.' "'What?' "'There, that calash filled with Roman peasants.' "'No.' "'Well, I am convinced they are all charming women.' "'How unfortunate that you were masked, Albert,' said Franz. "'Here was an opportunity of making up for past disappointments.' "'Oh,' replied he, half laughing, I hope the carnival will not pass without some amends in one shape or another. But in spite of Albert's hope, the day passed unmarked by any incident, excepting two or three encounters with the carriage full of Roman peasants. At one of these encounters, accidentally or purposely, Albert's mask fell off. He instantly rose and cast the remainder of the bouquets into the carriage, Doubtless one of the charming females Albert had detected beneath their coquettish disguise was touched by his gallantry, for, as the carriage of the two friends passed her, she threw a bunch of violets. Albert sees it, and as Franz had no reason to suppose it was meant for him, he suffered Albert to retain it. Albert placed it in his buttonhole, and the carriage went triumphantly on. "'Well,' said Franz to him, there is the beginning of an adventure. Laugh if you please. I really think so. So I will not abandon this bouquet. Pardieu, returned Franz, laughing. <laughs> In token of your ingratitude. The jest, however, soon appeared to become earnest, 
for when Albert and Franz again encountered the carriage with the contadini, the one who had thrown the violets to Albert clapped her hands when she beheld them in his buttonhole. "'Bravo, bravo,' said Franz. "'Things go wonderfully. Shall I leave you? Perhaps you should prefer being alone.' "'No,' replied he. "'I will not be caught like a fool at a first disclosure by a rendezvous under the clock, as they say at the opera balls. If the fair peasant wishes to carry matters any further, we shall find her, or rather she will find us to-morrow. Then she will give me some sign or other, and I shall know what I have to do.' "'On my word,' said Franz, "'you are wise as Nestor, and prudent as Ulysses.' and your fair Circe must be very skilful or very powerful if she succeed in changing you into a beast of any kind. Albert was right. The fair unknown had resolved, doubtless, to carry the intrigue no farther, for although the young men made several more turns, they did not again see the calash, which had turned up one of the neighbouring streets. Then they returned to the Rospoli Palace. But the Count and the blue domino had also disappeared. The two windows, hung with yellow damask, were still occupied by the persons whom the Count had invited. At this moment, the same bell that had proclaimed the beginning of the mascherata sounded the retreat. The file on the corso broke the line, and in a second all the carriages had disappeared. Franz and Albert were opposite the Via della Marata. The coachman, without saying a word, drove up, passed along the Piazza di Spagni and the Rospoli Palace and stopped at the door of the hotel. Signor Pastrini came to the door to receive his guests. Franz hastened to inquire after the Count and to express regret that he had not returned in sufficient time. But Pastrini reassured him by saying that the Count of Monte Cristo had ordered a second carriage for himself and that it had gone at four o'clock to fetch him from the Rospoli Palace. The Count had, moreover, charged him to offer the two friends the key of his box at the Argentina. Franz questioned Albert as to his intentions, but Albert had great projects to put into execution before going to the theatre, and instead of making any answer, he inquired if Signor Pastrini could procure him a tailor. "'A tailor,' said the host, "'and for what?' "'To make us, between now and uh, tomorrow, two Roman peasant costumes,' returned Albert. The host shook his head. "'To make you two costumes between now and tomorrow. I ask your Excellency's pardon, but this is quite a French demand. For the next week you will not find a single tailor who would content to sew six buttons on a waistcoat if you paid him a crown a piece for each button.' And "'Then I must give up the idea?' "'No, we have them ready-made. Leave all to me, and tomorrow. When you awake, you shall find a collection of costumes with which you will be satisfied. My dear Albert, said Franz, leave all to our host. He has already proved himself full of resources. Let us dine quietly and afterwards go and see the Algerian captive. Agreed, returned Albert. But remember, Signor Pastrini, that both my friend and myself attached the greatest importance to having tomorrow the costumes we have asked for. The host again assured them they might rely on him, and that their wishes should be attended to. Upon which Franz and Albert mounted to their apartments and proceeded to disencumber themselves of their costumes. Albert, as he took off his dress, carefully preserved the bunch of violets. It was his token reserved for the morrow. The two friends sat down to table, but they could not refrain from remarking the difference between the Count of Monte Cristo's table and that of Signor Pastrini. Truth compelled Franz, in spite of the dislike he seemed to have taken to the Count, to confess that the advantage was not on Pastrini's side. During dessert, the servant inquired at what time they wished for the carriage. Albert and Franz looked at each other, fearing really to abuse the Count's kindness. The servant understood them. His Excellency, the Count of Monte Cristo, had, he said, given positive orders that the carriage was to remain at their lordship's orders all day, and they could therefore dispose of it 
without fear of indiscretion. They resolved to profit by the Count's courtesy, and ordered the horses to be harnessed, while they substituted evening dress for that which they had on, and which was somewhat the worse for the numerous combats they had sustained. This precaution taken, they went to the theatre, and installed themselves in the Count's box. During the first act, the Countess G. entered. Her first look was at the box where she had seen the Count the previous evening, so that she perceived Franz and Albert in the place of the very person concerning whom she had expressed so strange an opinion to Franz. Her opera glass was so fixedly directed towards them that Franz saw it would be cruel not to satisfy her curiosity, and, availing himself of one of the privileges of the spectators of the Italian theatres, who use their boxes to hold receptions, the two friends went to pay their respects to the countess. Scarcely had they entered, when she motioned to France to assume the seat of honour. Albert, in his turn, sat behind. "'Well,' said she, hardly giving France time to sit down, "'it seems that you have nothing better to do than to make the acquaintance of this new Lord Ruthven, and you are already the best friends in the world.' "'Without being so far advanced as that, my dear Countess,' returned Franz, "'I cannot deny that we have abused his good nature all day.' "'All day?' "'Yes. This morning we breakfasted with him. "'We rode in his carriage all day, "'and now we have taken possession of his box.' "'You know him, then?' "'Yes and no.' "'How so?' "'It is a longer story.' "'Tell it to me.' It would frighten you too much. So much the more reason. At least wait until the story has a conclusion. Very well. I prefer complete histories. But tell me how you made his acquaintance. Did anyone introduce you to him? No, it was he who introduced himself to us. When? Last night after we left you. Through what medium? "'The very prosaic one of our landlord. "'He is staying, then, at the Hotel de Londres with you? "'Not only in the same hotel, but on the same floor. "'What is his name? For, of course, you know. "'The Count of Monte Cristo. "'That is not a family name. "'No, it is the name of the island he has purchased. "'And he is a Count?' A Tuscan Count. Well, we must put up with that, said the Countess, who was herself from one of the oldest Venetian families. Oh, what sort of man is he? Ask the Vicomte de Morcerf. You hear, Monsieur de Morcerf, I am referred to you, said the Countess. We should be very hard to please, madame, returned Albert. Did we not uh, think him delightful? A friend of ten years' standing could not have done more for us, or with a more perfect courtesy. Come, observed the countess, smiling. I see my vampire is only some millionaire who has taken the appearance of Lara in order to avoid being confounded with Monsieur de Rothschild. And you have seen her. Her? The beautiful Greek of yesterday. Non, we heard, I think, the sound of her guzzler. But she remained perfectly invisible. When you say invisible, interrupted Albert, it is only to keep up the mystery. For whom do you take the blue domino at the window with the white curtains? Where was this a window with white hangings? asked the Countess. At the Rospoli Palace. The Count had three windows at the Rospoli Palace? Yes. Did you pass through the Corso? Yes. Well, did you notice two windows hung with yellow damask, and one with white damask with a red cross? Those were the Count's windows. Why, he must be a nabob. Do you know what those three windows were worth? Two or three hundred Roman crowns? Two or three thousand? The deuce! Does his island produce him such a revenue? It does not bring him a bayoko. Then why did he purchase it? For a whim. He is an original, then. In reality, 
observed Albert. He seemed to be uh, somewhat eccentric. Were he at Paris and a frequenter of the theatres, I should say he was a poor devil literally mad. This morning he made two or three exits worthy of Didier or Antony. At this moment a fresh visitor entered, and, according to custom, France gave up his seat to him. This circumstance had, moreover, the effect of changing the conversation. An hour afterwards the two friends returned to their hotel. Signor Pastrini had already set about procuring their disguises for the morrow, and he assured them that they would be perfectly satisfied. The next morning, at nine o'clock, he entered Franz's room, followed by a tailor, who had eight or ten Roman peasant costumes on his arm. They selected two exactly alike, and charged the tailor to sew on each of their hats about twenty yards of ribbon, and to procure them two of the long silk sashes of different colours with which the lower orders decorate themselves on fete days. Albert was impatient to see how he looked in his new dress, a jacket and breeches of blue velvet, silk stockings with clocks, shoes with buckles, and a silk waistcoat. This picturesque attire set him off to great advantage, and when he had bound the scarf around his waist, and when his hat placed coquettishly on one side, and let fall on his shoulders a stream of ribbons, France was forced to confess that costume has much to do with the physical superiority we accord to certain nations. The Turks used to be so picturesque with their long and flowing robes, but are they now not hideous with their blue frocks buttoned up to the chin, and their red caps which make them look like a bottle of wine with a red seal? Franz complimented Albert, who looked at himself in the glass with an unequivocal smile of satisfaction. They were thus engaged when the Count of Monte Cristo entered. Gentlemen, said he, although a companion is agreeable, perfect freedom is sometimes still more agreeable. I come to say that today, and for the remainder of the carnival, I leave the carriage entirely at your disposal. The host will tell you I have three or four more, so that you will not inconvenience me in any way. Make use of it, I pray, for your pleasure or your business. The young men wished to decline, but they could find no good reason for refusing an offer which was so agreeable to them. The Count of Monte Cristo remained a quarter of an hour with them, conversing on all subjects with the greatest ease. He was, as we have already said, perfectly well acquainted with the literature of all countries. A glance at the walls of his salon proved to France and Albert that he was a connoisseur of pictures. A few words he let fall showed them that he was no stranger to the sciences, and he seemed much occupied with chemistry. The two friends did not venture to return the account the breakfast he had given them. It would have been too absurd to offer him in exchange for his excellent table the very inferior one, of Signor Pastrini. They told him so, frankly, and he received their excuses with the air of a man who appreciated their delicacy. Albert was charmed with the Count's manners, and he was only prevented from recognising him for a perfect gentleman by reason of his varied knowledge. The permission to do what he liked with the carriage pleased him above all, for the fair peasants had appeared in a most elegant carriage the preceding evening, and Albert was not sorry to be upon an equal footing with them. At half-past one they descended. The coachman and footman had put on their livery over their disguises, which gave them a more ridiculous appearance than ever, and which gained them the applause of France and Albert. Albert had fastened the faded bunch of violets to his buttonhole. At the first sound of the bell they hastened into the Corso by the Via Vittoria. At the second turn, a bunch of fresh violets, thrown from a carriage filled with harlequins, indicated to Albert that, like himself and his friend, the peasants had changed their costume also. And whether it was the result of chance, or whether a similar feeling had possessed them both, while he had changed his costume, they had assumed his. Albert placed the fresh bouquet in his buttonhole, but he kept the faded one in his hand, and when he again met the calash, he raised it to his lips, an action which seemed greatly to amuse not only the fair lady who had thrown it, but her joyous companions also. The day was as gay as the preceding one, perhaps even more animated and noisy. 
The Count appeared for an instant at his window, but when they again passed, he had disappeared. It is almost needless to say that the flirtation between Albert and the fair peasant continued all day. In the evening, on his return, Franz found a letter from the embassy, informing him that he would have the honour of being received by His Holiness the next day. At each previous visit he had made to Rome, he had solicited and obtained the same favour, and incited as much by a religious feeling as by gratitude, he was unwilling to quit the capital of the Christian world without laying his respectful homage at the feet of one of St. Peter's successors, who had set the rare example of all virtues. He did not then think of the Carnival, for in spite of his condescension and touching kindness, one cannot incline one's self without awe before the venerable and noble old man called Gregory XVI. On his return from the Vatican, Franz carefully avoided the Corso. He brought away with him a treasure of pious thoughts, to which the mad gaiety of the maskers would have been profanation. At ten minutes past five, Albert entered overjoyed. The harlequin had reassumed her peasant's costume, and as she passed she raised her mask. She was charming. Franz congratulated Albert, who received his congratulations with the air of a man conscious that they are merited. He had recognised by certain unmistakable signs that his fair incognita belonged to the aristocracy. He had made up his mind to write to her the next day. Franz remarked, while he gave these details, that Albert seemed to have something to ask of him, but that he was unwilling to ask it. He insisted upon it, declaring beforehand that he was willing to make any sacrifice the other wished. Albert let himself be pressed, just as long as friendship required, and then avowed to France that he would do him a great favour by allowing him to occupy the carriage alone the next day. Albert attributed to France's absence the extreme kindness of the fair present in raising her mask. France was not sufficiently egotistical to stop Albert in the middle of an adventure that promised to prove so agreeable to his curiosity and so flattering to his vanity. He felt assured that the perfect indiscretion of his friend would duly inform him of all that happened, and as during three years that he had travelled all over Italy a similar piece of good fortune had never fallen to his share, France was by no means sorry to learn how to act on such an occasion. He therefore promised Albert that he would content himself the morrow with witnessing the Carnival from the windows of the Rospoli Palace. The next morning he saw Albert pass and repass, holding an enormous bouquet, which he doubtless meant to make the bearer of his amorous epistle. This belief was changed into certainty when Franz saw the bouquet, conspicuous by a circle of white camellias, in the hand of a charming harlequin dressed in rose-coloured satin. The evening was no longer joy but delirium. Albert nothing doubted but the fair unknown would reply in the same manner. Franz anticipated his wishes by saying that the noise fatigued him, and that he should pass the next day in writing and looking over his journal. Albert was not deceived, for the next evening Franz saw him enter triumphantly shaking a folded paper which he held by one corner. Well, said he, was I mistaken? She has answered you, cried Franz. Read. This word was pronounced in a manner impossible to describe. Franz took the letter and read. Tuesday evening, at seven o'clock, descend from your carriage opposite the Via dei Pontifici, and follow the Roman peasant who snatches your torch from you. When you arrive at the first step of the church of San Giacomo, be sure to fasten a knot of rose-coloured ribbons to the shoulder of your harlequin costume, in order that you may be recognised. Until then, you will not see me. Constancy and discretion. Well, asked he when Franz had finished. What do you think of that? I think that the adventure is assuming a very agreeable appearance. I think so also, replied Albert, and I very much fear you will go alone to the Duke of Bracciano's ball. Franz and Albert had received that morning an invitation from the celebrated Roman banker. Take care, Albert, said Franz. All the nobility of Rome will be present and if your fair incognita belong to the higher class of society, 
she must go there. Whether she goes there or not, my opinion is still the same, returned Albert. You have read the letter? Yes. You know I'm perfectly the women of the Mezzocito are educated in Italy. This is the name of the lower class. Yes. Well, read the letter again. Look at the writing and find, if you can, any blemish in the language or orthography. The writer was in reality charming, and the orthography irreproachable. You are born to good fortune, said Franz, as he returned the letter. Laugh as much as you will, replied Albert. I, I mean love. You allow me, cried Franz. I see that I shall not only go alone to the Duke of Bracciano's, but also return to Florence alone. If my unknown be as amiable as she is beautiful, said Albert, I shall fix myself at Rome for six weeks at least. I adore Rome, and I have always had a great taste for archaeology. Come, two or three more such adventures, and I do not despair of seeing you a member of the Academy. Doubtless Albert was about to discuss seriously his right to the academic chair when they were informed that dinner was ready. Albert's love had not taken away his appetite. He hastened with France to seat himself, free to recommence the discussion after dinner. After dinner, the Count of Monte Cristo was announced. They had not seen him for two days. Signor Pastrini informed them that business had called him to Civita Vecchia. He had started the previous evening and had only returned an hour since. He was charming. Whether he kept a watch over himself or whether by accident he did not sound the acrimonious chords that in other circumstances had been touched. He was tonight like everybody else. The man was an enigma to France. The Count must feel sure that France recognized him. And yet he had not let fall a single word indicating any previous acquaintance between them. On his side, however great France's desire was to allude to their former interview, the fear of being disagreeable to the man who had loaded him and his friend with kindness prevented him from mentioning it. The Count had learned that the two friends had sent to secure a box at the Argentina Theatre, and were told they were all let. In consequence, he brought them the key of his own. At least, such was the apparent motive of his visit. Franz and Albert made some difficulty, alleging their fear of depriving him of it, but the Count replied that as he was going to the Pali Theatre, the box at the Argentina Theatre would be lost if they did not profit by it. This assurance determined the two friends to accept it. Franz had by degrees become accustomed to the Count's pallor, which had so forcibly struck him at their first meeting. He could not refrain from admiring the severe beauty of his features, the only defect, or rather the principal quality of which, was the pallor, truly a Byronic hero. Franz could not, we will not say, see him, but even think of him, without imagining his stern head upon Manfred's shoulders, or beneath Lara's helmet. His forehead was marked with the line that indicates the constant presence of bitter thoughts. He had the fiery eyes that seemed to penetrate to the very soul, and the haughty and disdainful upper lip that gives to the words it utters a peculiar character that impresses them on the minds of those to whom they are addressed. The Count was no longer young. He was at least forty, and yet it was easy to understand that he was formed to rule the young men with whom he associated at present. And to complete his resemblance with the fantastic heroes of the English poet, the Count seemed to have the power of fascination. Albert was constantly expatiating on their good fortune in meeting such a man. France was less enthusiastic, but the Count exercised over him also the ascendancy a strong mind always acquires over a mind less domineering. He thought several times of the project the Count had of visiting Paris, and he had no doubt but that with his eccentric character, his characteristic face, and his colossal fortune, he would produce a great effect there. And yet he did not wish to be at Paris when the Count was there. The evening passed as evenings mostly pass at Italian theatres, that is, not in listening to the music, but in paying visits and conversing. The Countess G wished to revive the subject of the Count, but France announced he had something far newer to tell her, 
and, in spite of Albert's demonstrations of false modesty, he informed the Countess of the great event which had preoccupied them for the last three days. As similar intrigues are not uncommon in Italy, if we may credit travellers, the Comtesse did not manifest the least incredulity, but congratulated Albert on his success. They promised upon separating to meet at the Duke of Bracciano's ball, to which all Rome was invited. The heroine of the bouquet kept her word. She gave Albert no sign of her existence the morrow or the day after. At length, Tuesday came, the last and most tumultuous day of the carnival. On Tuesday the theatres open at ten o'clock in the morning, as Lent begins after eight at night. On Tuesday all those who through want of money, time or enthusiasm have not been to see the carnival before mingle in the gaiety and contribute to the noise and excitement. From two o'clock till five, Franz and Albert followed in the fete, exchanging handfuls of confetti with the other carriages and the pedestrians who crowded amongst the horses' feet and the carriage wheels without a single accident, a single dispute, or a single fight. The fetes are veritable pleasure days to the Italians. The author of this history, who has resided five or six years in Italy, does not recollect to have ever seen a ceremony interrupted by one of these events so common in other countries. Albert was triumphant in his harlequin costume. A knot of rose-coloured ribbons fell from his shoulder almost to the ground. In order that there might be no confusion, France wore his peasant's costume. As the day advanced, the tumult became greater. There was not on the pavement, in the carriages, at the windows, a single tongue that was silent, a single arm that did not move. It was a human storm made up of a thunder of cries and a hall of sweetmeats, flowers, eggs, oranges and nosegays. At three o'clock the sound of fireworks, let off on the Piazza del Popolo and the Piazza di Venezia, heard with difficulty amid the din and confusion, announced that the races were about to begin. The races, like the Moccoli, are one of the episodes peculiar to the last days of the Carnival. At the sound of the fireworks, the carriages instantly broke ranks and retired by the adjacent streets. All these evolutions are executed with an inconceivable address and marvellous rapidity without the police interfering in the matter. The pedestrians range themselves against the walls, then the trampling of horses and the clashing of steel were heard. A detachment of cabiniers, fifteen abreast, galloped up the Corso in order to clear it for the Barberi. When the detachment arrived at the Piazza di Venezia, a second volley of fireworks was discharged to announce that the street was clear. Almost instantly, in the midst of a tremendous and general outcry, seven or eight horses excited by the shouts of three hundred thousand spectators, passed by like lightning. Then the castle of St. Angelo fired three cannon to indicate that number three had won. Immediately, without any other signal, the carriages moved on, flowing on towards the Corso, down all the streets like torrents pent up for a while, while again flow into the parent river, and the immense stream again continued its course between its two granite banks. A new source of noise and movement was added to the crowd. The sellers of Moccoletti entered on the scene. The Moccoli, or Moccoletti, are candles which vary in size from the Pascal taper to the rushlight, and which give to each actor in the great final scene of the Carnival two very serious problems to grapple with. First, how to keep his own Moccoletto alight, and secondly, how to extinguish the Moccoletti of others. The moccoletto is like life. Man has found but one means of transmitting it, and that one comes from God. But he has discovered a thousand means of taking it away, and the devil has somewhat aided him. The moccoletto is kindled by approaching it to a light, but who can describe the thousand means of extinguishing the moccoletto? The gigantic bellows, the monstrous extinguishers, the superhuman fans. Everyone hastened to purchase Moccoletti, France and Albert among the rest. The night was rapidly approaching and already at the cry of Moccoletti, repeated by the shrill voices of a thousand vendors, two or three stars began to burn among the crowd. It was a signal. 
At the end of 10 minutes, 50,000 lights glittered, descending from the Palazzo di Venezia to the Piazza del Popolo, and mounting from the Piazza del Popolo to the Palazzo di Venezia. It seemed like the fete of jack-o'-lanterns. It is impossible to form any idea of it without having seen it. Suppose that all the stars had descended from the sky and mingled in a wild dance on the face of the earth, the whole accompanied by cries that were never heard in any other part of the world. The Facino follows the prince, the Transteverin the citizen, everyone blowing, extinguishing, relighting. Had old Aeolus appeared at this moment, he would have been proclaimed king of the Mokoli, and Aquilo the heir presumptive to the throne. This battle of folly and flame continued for two hours. The Corso was light as day. The features of the spectators on the third and fourth stories were visible. Every five minutes, Albert took out his watch. At length it pointed to seven. The two friends were in the Via del Pontifici. Albert sprang out, bearing his moccoletto in his hand. Two or three masks strove to knock his moccoletto out of his hand, but Albert a first-rate pugilist, sent them rolling in the street, one after the other, and continued his course towards the church of San Giacomo. The steps were crowded with masks, who strove to snatch each other's torches. Franz followed Albert with his eyes and saw him mount the first step. Instantly, a mask wearing the well-known costume of a peasant woman snatched his moccoletto from him, without his offering any resistance. Franz was too far off to hear what they said, but without doubt nothing hostile passed, for he saw Albert disappear arm in arm with the peasant girl. He watched them pass through the crowd for some time, but at length he lost sight of them in the Via Macello. Suddenly the bell that gives the signal for the end of the carnival sounded, and at the same instant all the moccoletti were extinguished as if by enchantment. It seemed as though one immense blast of the wind had extinguished every one, Franz found himself in utter darkness. No sound was audible save that of the carriages that were carrying the maskers home. Nothing was visible save a few lights that burnt behind the windows. The Carnival was over. End of chapter 36《ハッタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタタ It seemed as though Rome, under the magic breath of some demon of the night, had suddenly changed into a vast tomb. By a chance which added yet more to the intensity of the darkness, the moon which was on the wane did not rise until eleven o'clock, and the streets which the young man traversed were plunged in the deepest obscurity. The distance was short, and at the end of ten minutes his carriage, or rather the Count's, stopped before the Hôtel de Londres. Dinner was waiting, but as Albert had told him that he should not return so soon, Franz sat down without him. Signor Pastrini, who had been accustomed to see them dine together, inquired into the cause of his absence, but Franz merely replied that Albert had received on the previous evening an invitation which he had accepted. The sudden extinction of the Moccoletti, the darkness which had replaced the light, and the silence which had succeeded the turmoil, had left in Franz's mind a certain depression, which was not free from uneasiness. He therefore dined very silently, in spite of the officious attention of his host, who presented himself two or three times to inquire if he wanted anything. Franz resolved to wait for Albert as late as possible. He ordered the carriage, therefore, for eleven o'clock, desiring Signor Pastrini to inform him the moment that Albert returned to the hotel. At eleven o'clock, Albert had not come back. Franz dressed himself and went out, telling his host that he was going to pass the night at the Duke of Bracciano's. 
The house of the Duke of Bracciano is one of the most delightful in Rome. The Duchess, one of the last heiresses of the Colonas, does its honours with the most consummate grace, and thus their fête have a European celebrity. Franz and Albert had brought to Rome letters of introduction to them, and their first question on his arrival was to inquire the whereabouts of his travelling companion. Franz replied that he had left him at the moment they were all about to extinguish the Mocoli, and that he had lost sight of him in the Via Macello. "'Then he has not returned,' said the Duke. "'I waited for him until this hour,' replied Franz. "'And do you know whether he went?' "'No, not precisely. However, I think it was something very like a rendezvous.' "'Diavolo,' said the Duke. "'This is a bad day, or rather a bad night, to be out late, is it not, Countess?' These words were addressed to the Countess G., who had just arrived and was leaning on the arm of Signor Tolonia, the Duke's brother. "'I think, on the contrary, that it is a charming night,' replied the Countess. "'And those who are here will complain of but one thing. It's too rapid flight.' "'I'm not speaking,' said the Duke with a smile, "'of the persons who are here. The men run no other danger than that of falling in love with you, and the women of falling ill of jealousy at seeing you so lovely. I meant persons who are out in the streets of Rome. Ah, asked the countess, who is out in the streets of Rome at this hour, unless it be to go to a ball? Our friend Albert de Morcerf, countess, whom I left in pursuit of his unknown about seven o'clock this evening, said Franz, and whom I have not seen since. "'And don't you know where he is?' "'Not at all. "'Is he armed? "'He is in masquerade. "'You should not have allowed him to go,' said the Duke to France. "'You, who know Rome better than he does. "'You might as well have tried to stop number three of the Barberi, "'who gained the prize in the race today,' replied France. "'And then, moreover, what could happen to him?' "'Who can tell?' The night is gloomy, and the Tiber is very near the Via Macello. Franz felt a sudden shudder run through his veins at observing that the feeling of the Duke and the Countess was so much in unison with his own personal disquietude. "'I informed them at the hotel that I had the honour of passing the night here, Duke,' said Franz, "'and desired them to come and inform me of his return.' "'Ah,' replied the Duke, here, I think, is one of my servants who is seeking you. The Duke was not mistaken. When he saw Franz, the servant came up to him. Your Excellency, he said, the master of the Hotel de Londres has sent to let you know that a man is waiting for you with a letter from the Vicomte of Morcerf. A letter from the Vicomte? exclaimed Franz. Yes. And who is the man? I do not know. Why did he not bring it to me here? The messenger did not say. And where is the messenger? He went away directly. He saw me enter the ballroom to find you. Oh, said the countess to Franz, go with all speed, poor young man. Perhaps some accident has happened to him. I will hasten, replied Franz. Shall we see you again to give us any information? inquired the countess. Yes, if it is not any serious affair. Otherwise I cannot answer as to what I may do myself. Be prudent in any event, said the countess. Oh, pray be assured of that. Franz took his hat and went away in haste. He had sent away his carriage with orders for it to fetch him at two o'clock. Fortunately, the Palazzo Bracciano, which is on one side in the Corso, and on the other in the Square of the Holy Apostles, is hardly ten minutes' walk from the Hotel de Londres. As he came near the hotel, Franz saw a man in the middle of the street. He had no doubt that it was the messenger from Albert. The man was wrapped up in a large cloak. He went up to him, but to his extreme astonishment, the stranger first addressed him. "'What wants your excellency of me?' inquired the man, retreating a step or two as if to keep on his guard. "'Are not you the person who brought me a letter?' inquired Franz. "'From the Vicomte of Morcerf. "'Your Excellency lodges at Pastrini's hotel.' "'I do.' 
Your Excellency is the travelling companion of the Viscount. I am. Your Excellency's name is the Baron Franz d'Epinay. Then it is to Your Excellency that this letter is addressed. Is there any answer? inquired Franz, taking the letter from him. Yes, your friend at least hopes so. Come upstairs with me, and I will give it to you. I prefer waiting here, said the messenger with a smile. And why? Your Excellency will know when you have read the letter. Shall I find you here, then? Certainly. Franz entered the hotel. On the staircase he met Signor Pastrini. Well, said the landlord. Well, what? responded Franz. You have seen the man who desired to speak with you from your friend? he asked of Franz. Yes, I have seen him, he replied, and he has handed this letter to me. Light the candles in my apartment, if you please. The innkeeper gave orders to a servant to go before Franz with a light. The young man had found Signor Pastrini looking very much alarmed, and this had only made him the more anxious to read Albert's letter. And so he went instantly towards the wax light and unfolded it. It was written and signed by Albert. Franz read it twice before he could comprehend what it contained. It was thus worded. My dear fellow, the moment you have received this, have the kindness to take the letter of credit from my pocket book, which you will find in the square drawer of the secretary. Add your own to it if it be not sufficient. Run to Torionia, draw from him instantly four thousand piastres, and give them to the bearer. It is urgent that I should have this money without delay. I do not say more. Rely on you as you may rely on me, your friend, Albert de Morcerf. P.S. I now believe in Italian banditti. Below these lines were written in a strange hand the following in Italian. Se alle sei della mattina, le quattro mille piastre non sono nelle mie mani, alla sette il conte Alberto avrà cessato di vivere. Luigi Vampa If by six in the morning the four thousand piastre are not in my hands, by seven o'clock the Count Albert will have ceased to live. This second signature explained everything to Franz, who now understood the objection of the messenger to coming up into the apartment. The street was safer for him. Albert then had fallen into the hands of the famous bandit chief, in whose existence he had for so long a time refused to believe. There was no time to lose. He hastened to open the secretary and found the pocketbook in the drawer, and in it the letter of credit. There were in all six thousand piastres, but of these six thousand Albert had already expended three thousand. As to France, he had no letter of credit as he lived at Florence, and had only come to Rome to pass seven or eight days. He had brought but a hundred louis, and of these he had not more than fifty left. Thus seven or eight hundred piastres were wanting to them both to make up the sum that Albert required. True, he might in such a case rely on the kindness of Signor Torlonia. He was therefore about to return to the Palazzo Bracciano without loss of time, when suddenly a luminous idea crossed his mind. He remembered the Count of Monte Cristo. Franz was about to ring for Signor Pastrini, when that worthy presented himself. "'My dear sir,' he said hastily, "'do you know if the Count is within?' "'Yes, Your Excellency. He has this moment returned.' "'Is he in bed?' "'I should say no. "'Then ring at his door, if you please.' and request him to be so kind as to give me an audience. Signor Pastrini did as he was desired, and returning five minutes after, he said, The Count awaits your Excellency. Franz went along the corridor, and a servant introduced him to the Count. He was in a small room which Franz had not yet seen, and which was surrounded with divans. The Count came toward him. Well, what good wind blows you hither at this hour? And he, have you come to sup with me? It would be very kind of you. No, I have come to speak to you of a very serious matter. A serious matter, said the Count, looking at Franz with the earnestness usual to him. 
and what may it be? Are we alone? Yes, replied the Count, going to the door and returning. Franz gave him Albert's letter. Read that, he said. The Count read it. Well, well, said he. Did you see the postscript? I did indeed. Se alle sei della mattina le quattro mille piastre non sono nella mei mani, alla sette il conte Alberto avrà cessato di vivere. Luigi Vampa. What think you of that? inquired Franz. Have you the money he demands? Yes, all but eight hundred piastres. The Count went to his secretary, opened it, and pulling out a drawer filled with gold, said to Franz, I hope you will not offend me by applying to any one but myself. You see, on the contrary, I come to you first and instantly, replied Franz. And I thank you. Have what you will. And he made a sign to Franz to take what he pleased. Is it absolutely necessary, then, to send the money to Luigi Vampa? asked the young man, looking fixedly in his turn at the Count. Judge for yourself, replied he. The postscript is explicit. I think that if you would take the trouble of reflecting, you could find a way of simplifying the negotiation, said Franz. How so? returned the Count with surprise. If we were to go together to Luigi Vampa, I am sure he would not refuse you Albert's freedom. What influence can I possibly have over a bandit? Have you not just rendered him a service that can never be forgotten? What is that? Have you not saved Peppino's life? Well, well, said the Count. Who told you that? No matter, I know it. The Count knit his brows and remained silent an instant. And if I went to seek Vampa, would you accompany me? If my society would not be disagreeable? Be it so. It is a lovely night, and a walk without Rome will do us both good. Shall I take any arms? For what purpose? Any money? It is useless. Where is the man who brought the letter? In the street. He awaits the answer. Yes. I must learn where we are going. I will summon him thither. It is useless. He would not come up. To your apartments, perhaps, but he will not make any difficulty at entering mine. The Count went to the window of the apartment that looked onto the street and whistled in a peculiar manner. The man in the mantle quitted the wall and advanced into the middle of the street. Salite! said the Count, in the same tone in which he would have given an order to his servant. The messenger obeyed without the least hesitation, but rather with alacrity, and mounting the steps at a bound, entered the hotel. Five seconds afterwards, he was at the door of the room. "'Ah, it is you, Peppino,' said the Count. But Peppino, instead of answering, threw himself on his knees, seized the Count's hand, and covered it with kisses. "'Ah,' said the Count, you have then not forgotten that I saved your life. That is strange, for it is a week ago. No, Excellency, and never shall I forget it, returned Peppino, with an accent of profound gratitude. Never? That is a long time. But it is something that you believe, so rise and answer. Peppino glanced anxiously at Franz. Oh, you may speak before His Excellency, said he. He is one of my friends. You allow me to give you this title, continued the Count in French. It is necessary to excite this man's confidence. You can speak before me, said Franz. I am a friend of the Count's. Good, returned Peppino. I am ready to answer any questions your Excellency may address to me. How did the Viscount Albert fall into Luigi's hands? Excellency, the Frenchman's carriage passed several times, the one in which was Teresa. The chief's mistress? Yes, the Frenchman threw her a bouquet. Teresa returned it, all this with the consent of the chief, who was in the carriage. What? cried Franz. 
was Luigi Vampa in a carriage with the Roman peasants? It was he who drove it disguised as the coachman, replied Peppino. Well, said the Count. Well, then, the Frenchman took off his mask. Teresa, with the chief's consent, did the same. The Frenchman asked for a rendezvous. Teresa gave him one. Only, instead of Teresa, it was Beppo who was on the steps of the church of San Giacomo. What? exclaimed Franz. The peasant girl who snatched his moccoletto from him? Was a lad of fifteen, replied Peppino. But it was no disgrace to your friend to have been deceived. Beppo has taken in plenty of others. And Beppo led him outside the walls, said the Count. Exactly so. A carriage was waiting at the end of the Via Macello. Beppo got in, inviting the Frenchman to follow him, and he did not wait to be asked twice. He gallantly offered the right-hand seat to Beppo and sat by him. Beppo told him he was going to take him to a villa, a league from Rome. The Frenchman assured him he would follow him to the end of the world. The coachman went up the Via di Ripetta and the Porta San Paolo, and when there were two hundred yards inside as the Frenchman became somewhat too forward, Beppo put a brace of pistols to his head. The coachman pulled up and did the same. At the same time, four of the band who were concealed on the banks of the Almo surrounded the carriage. The Frenchman made some resistance and nearly strangled Beppo, but he could not resist a five-armed man and was forced to yield. They made him get out, walk along the banks of the river, and then brought him to Teresa and Luigi, who were waiting for him in the catacombs of San Sebastian. Well, said the Count, turning towards France, it seems to me that this is a very likely story. What did you say to it? Why, that I should think it very amusing, replied France, if it had happened to any one but poor Albert. And in the truth, if you had not found me here, said the Count, it might have proved a gallant adventure which would have cost your friend dear. But now, be assured, his alarm will be the only serious consequence. And shall we go and find him? inquired Franz. Oh, decidedly, sir. He is in a very picturesque place. Do you know the catacombs of St. Sebastian? I was never in them, but I have often resolved to visit them. Well, here is an opportunity made to your hand, and it would be difficult to contrive a better. Have you a carriage? No. That is of no consequence. I always have one ready, day and night. Always ready? Yes, I am a very capricious being, and I should tell you that sometimes when I arise, or after my dinner, or in the middle of the night, I resolve on starting for some particular point, and away I go. The Count rang, and a footman appeared. Order out the carriage, he said, and remove the pistols which are in the holsters. You need not awaken the coachman. Ali will drive. In a very short time the noise of the wheels was heard, and the carriage stopped at the door. The Count took out his watch. Half past twelve, he said. We might start at five o'clock and be in time, but the delay may cause your friend to pass an uneasy night, and therefore we had better go with all speed to extricate him from the hands of the infidels. Are you still resolved to accompany me? more determined than ever. Well, then, come along. France and the Count went downstairs, accompanied by Peppino. At the door they found the carriage. Ali was on the box, in whom France recognised the dumb slave of the grotto of Monte Cristo. France and the Count got into the carriage. Peppino placed himself beside Ali, and they set off at a rapid pace. Ali had received his instructions and went down the Corso, crossed the Campo Vaccino, went up the Strada San Gregorio and reached the gates of San Sebastian. Then the porter raised some difficulties. But the Count of Monte Cristo produced a permit from the Governor of Rome, allowing him to leave or enter the city at any hour of the day or night. The portcullis was therefore raised, the porter had a louis for his trouble, and they went on their way. 
The road which the carriage now traversed was the ancient Appian Way, and bordered with tombs. From time to time, by the light of the moon which began to rise, Franz imagined that he saw something like a sentinel appear at various points among the ruins, and suddenly retreat into the darkness on a signal from Peppino. A short time before they reached the baths of Caracalla, the carriage stopped. Peppino opened the door, and the Count and Franz alighted. "'In ten minutes,' said the Count to his companion, "'we shall be there.' He then took Peppino aside, gave him an order in a low voice, and Peppino went away, taking with him a torch brought with them in the carriage. Five minutes elapsed, during which Franz saw the shepherd going along a narrow path that led over the irregular and broken surface of the Campagna, and finally he disappeared in the midst of the tall red herbage, which seemed like the bristling mane of an enormous lion. Now, said the Count, let us follow him. Franz and the Count, in their turn, then advanced along the same path, which, at the distance of a hundred paces, led them over a declivity to the bottom of a small valley. They then perceived two men conversing in the obscurity. "'Ought we to go on?' asked Franz of the Count. "'Or shall we wait a while?' "'Let us go on. Peppino will have warned the sentry of our coming.' One of the two men was Peppino, and the other a bandit on the lookout. Franz and the Count advanced, and the bandit saluted them. "'Your Excellency,' said Peppino, addressing the Count, "'if you will follow me, the opening of the catacombs is close at hand.' "'Go on, then,' replied the Count. They came to an opening behind a clump of bushes, and in the midst of a pile of rocks by which a man could scarcely pass. Peppino glided first into this crevice. After they got along a few paces, the passage widened. Peppino passed, lighted his torch, and turned to see if they came after him. The Count first reached an open space, and Franz followed him closely. The passageway sloped in a gentle descent, enlarging as they proceeded. Still Franz and the Count were compelled to advance in a stooping posture, and were scarcely able to proceed abreast of one another. They went on a hundred and fifty paces in this way, and then were stopped by... "'Who comes there?' At the same time, they saw the reflection of a torch on a carbine barrel. "'A friend,' responded Peppino, and, advancing alone towards the sentry, he said a few words to him in a low tone, and then he, like the first, saluted the nocturnal visitors, making a sign that they may, may proceed. Behind the sentinel was a staircase with twenty steps. France and the Count descended these and found themselves in a mortuary chamber. Five corridors diverged like the rays of a star, and the walls, dug into niche, which were arranged one above the other in the shape of coffins, showed that they were at last in the catacombs. Down one of the corridors, whose extent it was impossible to determine, rays of light were visible. The Count laid his hand on Francis's shoulder. "'Would you like to see a camp of bandits in repose?' he inquired. "'Exceedingly,' replied Franz. Come with me, then, Peppino, put out the torch. Peppino obeyed, and Franz and the Count were in utter darkness, except that fifty paces in advance of them, a reddish glare, more evidence since Peppino had put out his torch, was visible along the wall. They advanced silently, the Count guiding Franz as if he had the singular faculty of seeing in the dark. Franz himself, however, saw his way more plainly in proportion as he went on towards the light which served in some manner as a guide. Three arcades were before them, and the middle one was used as a door. These arcades opened on one side into the corridor where the Count and Franz were, and on the other into a large square chamber, entirely surrounded by niche, similar to those of which we have spoken. In the midst of this chamber were four stones, which had formerly served as an altar, as was evident from the cross which still surmounted them. A lamp placed at the base of a pillar lighted up with its pale and flickering flame the singular scene which presented itself to the eyes of the two visitors concealed in the shadow. A man was seated with his elbow leaning on the column, and was reading with his back turned to the arcades, through the openings of which the newcomers contemplated him. This was the chief of the band, Luigi Vampa. 
Around him, and in groups according to their fancy, lying in their mantles, or with their backs against a sort of stone bench, which went all around the columbarium, were to be seen twenty brigands or more, each having his carbine within reach. At the other end, silently scarcely visible and like a shadow, was a sentinel, who was walking up and down before a grotto, which was only distinguishable because in that spot the darkness seemed more dense than elsewhere. When the Count thought France had gazed sufficiently on this picturesque tableau, he raised his finger to his lips to warn him to be silent, and, ascending the three steps which led to the corridor of the columbarium, entered the chamber by the middle arcade, and advanced towards Vampa, who was so intent on the book before him that he did not hear the noise of his footsteps. "'Who comes a there?' cried the sentinel, who was less abstracted, and who saw by the lamplight a shadow approaching his chief. At this challenge, Vampa rose quickly, drawing at the same moment a pistol from his girdle. In a moment all the bandits were on their feet, and twenty carbines were levelled at the count. "'Well,' said he in a voice perfectly calm, and no muscle of his countenance disturbed, "'well, my dear Vampa, it appears to me that you receive a friend with a great deal of ceremony.' "'Ground arms,' explained the chief, with an imperative sign of the hand, while with the other he took off his hat respectfully. Then, turning to the singular personage who had caused this scene, he said, "'Your pardon, Your Excellency, but I was so far from expecting the honour of a visit that I did not really recognise you.' "'It seems that your memory is equally short in everything, Vampa,' said the Count, "'and that not only do you forget people's faces, but also the conditions you make with them. "'What conditions have I forgotten, Your Excellency?' inquired the bandit, with the air of a man who, having committed an error, is anxious to repair it. "'Was it not agreed,' asked the Count, "'that not only my person, but also that of my friends, should be respected by you?' "'And how have I broken that treaty, Your Excellency?' You have this evening carried off and conveyed hither the Vicomte Albert de Morcerf. Well, continued the Count in a tone that made France shudder, this young gentleman is one of my friends. This young gentleman lodges in the same hotel as myself. This young gentleman has been up and down the Corso for eight hours in my private carriage, and yet, I repeat to you, you have carried him off and conveyed him hither, and— added the Count, taking the letter from his pocket. "'You have set a ransom on him, as if he were an utter stranger.' "'Why did you not tell me all this, you?' inquired the brigand chief, turning towards his men, who all retreated before his look. "'Have you caused me thus to fall in my word towards a gentleman like the Count, who has all our lives in his hands? By heavens, if I thought one of you knew that the young gentleman was the friend of His Excellency!' I would blow his brains out with my own hand. Well, said the Count, turning towards France, I told you there was some mistake in this. Are you not alone? asked Vampa with uneasiness. I am with the person to whom this letter was addressed, and to whom I desired to prove that Luigi Vampa was a man of his word. Come, Your Excellency, the Count added, turning to France. Here is Luigi Vampa, who will himself express to you his deep regret at the mistake he has committed. France approached the chief, advancing several steps to meet him. "'Welcome among us, Your Excellency,' he said to him. "'You heard what the Count just said, and also my reply. Let me add that I would not, for the four thousand piastres at which I had fixed your friend's ransom, that this had happened. But said Franz, looking around him uneasily. "'Where is the Vicomte? I do not see him.' "'Nothing has happened to him, I hope,' said the Count, frowningly. "'The prisoner is there,' replied Vampa, pointing to the hollow space in front of which the bandit was on guard. "'And I will go myself and tell him he is free.' The chief went towards the place he had pointed out as Albert's prison, and Franz and the Count followed him. "'What is the prisoner doing?' inquired Vampa of the sentinel. "'Ma foi, Captain,' replied the sentry, 
I do not know. For the last hour I have not heard him stir. Come in, your excellency, said Vampa. The Count and Franz ascended seven or eight steps after the chief, who drew back a bolt and opened a door. Then, by the gleam of a lamp similar to that which lighted the columbarium, Albert was to be seen wrapped up in a cloak which one of the bandits had lent to him, lying in a corner in profound slumber. Come, said the Count, smiling with his own peculiar smile, not so bad for a man who is to be shot at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Vampa looked at Albert with a kind of admiration. He was not insensible to such a proof of courage. You are right, your excellency, he said. This must be one of your friends. Then going to Albert, he touched him on the shoulder, saying, Will your excellency please to awaken? Albert stretched out his arms, rubbed his eyelids, and opened his eyes. Oh, said he, is it you, Captain? You should have allowed me to sleep. I had such a delightful dream. I was dancing the gallop at Trollonio's with the Countess G. Then he drew his watch from his pocket that he might see how time sped. Half past one only, said he. Why the devil do you rouse me at this hour? To tell you that you are free, Your Excellency. My dear fellow, said Albert with perfect ease of mind, remember for the future Napoleon's maxim, never awaken me but for bad news. If you had let me slip on, I should have finished my gallop and have been grateful to you all my life. So then, they have paid my ransom? No, Your Excellency. Well then, am I free? A person to whom I can refuse nothing has come to demand you. Come hither. Yes, hither. Really? Then that person is a most amiable person. Albert looked around and perceived Franz. What? said he. Is it you, my dear Franz, whose devotion and friendship are thus displayed? No, not I, replied Franz, but our neighbor, the Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, my dear Count, said Albert gaily, arranging his cravat and wristbands. You are really most kind, and I hope you will consider me as under eternal obligations to you, in the first place for the carriage, and in the next for this visit. And he put out his hand to the Count, who shuddered as he gave his own, but who nevertheless did give it. The bandit gazed on this scene with amazement. He was evidently accustomed to see his prisoners tremble before him, and yet here was one whose gay temperament was not that for a moment altered as for France. He was enchanted at the way in which Albert had sustained the national honour in the presence of the bandit. My dear Albert, he said, if you will make haste, we shall yet have time to finish the night at Torlonia's. You may conclude your interrupted gallop so that you will owe no ill will to Signor Luigi, who has indeed, throughout this whole affair, acted like a gentleman. You are decidedly right, and we may reach the palazzo by two o'clock, Signor Luigi, continued Albert. Is there any formality to fulfill before I take leave of your excellency? None, sir, replied the bandit. You are as free as air. Well then, a happy and merry life to you. Come, gentlemen, come. And Albert, followed by France and the Count, descended the staircase, crossed the square chamber, where stood all the bandits, hat in hand. Peppino, said the brigand chief, give me the torch. What are you going to do? inquired the Count. I will show you the way back myself, said the captain. That is the least honour that I can render to your excellency. And taking the lighted torch from the hands of the herdsman, he preceded his guests, not as a servant who performs an act of civility, but like a king who precedes ambassadors. On reaching the door he bowed. And now, your excellency, added he, allow me to repeat my apologies, and I hope you will not entertain any resentment at what has occurred. No, my dear Vampa, replied the Count, besides you compensate for your mistakes in so gentlemanly a way that one almost feels obliged to you for having committed them. "'Gentlemen,' 
added the chief, turning towards the young man. Perhaps the offer may not appear very tempting to you, but if you should ever feel inclined to pay me a second visit wherever I may be, you shall be welcome. Franz and Albert bowed. The Count went out first, then Albert. Franz paused for a moment. "'Has Your Excellency anything to ask me?' said Vampa with a smile. "'Yes, I have,' replied Franz. "'I am curious to know what work you are perusing with so much attention as we entered.' "'César's commentaries,' said the bandit. "'It is my favourite work.' "'Well, are you coming?' asked Albert. "'Yes,' replied Franz. "'Here I am.' And he, in his turn, left the caves." They advanced to the plain. Ah, your pardon, said Albert, turning around. Will you allow me, Captain? And he lighted his cigar at Vampa's torch. Now, my dear Count, he said, let us on with all the speed we may. I am enormously anxious to finish my night at the Duke of Bracciano's. They found the carriage where they had left it. The Count said a word in Arabic to Ali, and the horses went on at great speed. It was just two o'clock by Elbert's watch when the two friends entered into the dancing room. Their return was quite an event, but as they entered together, all uneasiness on Albert's account ceased instantly. Madame, said the Viscount of Morcerf, advancing towards the Countess, yesterday you were so condescending as to promise me a gallop. I am rather late in claiming this gracious promise, but here is my friend, whose character for veracity you will know, and he will assure you the delay arose from no fault of mine. And as at this moment the orchestra gave the signal for the waltz, Albert put his arm round the waist of the countess, and disappeared with her in the whirl of dancers. In the meanwhile, Franz was considering the singular shudder that had passed over the Count of Monte Cristo at the moment when he had been in some sort forced to give his hand to Albert. End of chapter 37